So they might say, okay. like, is there any like LDS archaeologists, anthropologists, geologists who are supporting it? And if not, is that not a sign that like if experts who are like archaeologists or anthropologists or geologists are leaning more towards Mesoamerica, is that not like a little bit of a red flag towards like, should we be more cautious when it comes to accepting yeah. the evidence yeah. being proposed for a heartland? What's your response to that? And, and that's why I keep coming back to this. For me, it's really the issue of Camorra or bust. Mm -hmm. Because if the prophets were wrong about the Hill Camorra and Oliver Cowdery didn't really go in the repository and Moroni didn't really talk to Joseph Smith about Camorra and the messenger didn't really take the plates, the abridged plates to Camorra and all these narratives that we have fully documented were all false, then where does that leave us with the rest of the narrative? Mormonism with the Murph, where Larry Singh explores church history and the church's truth claims. Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel, Mormonism with the Murph, where Larry Saint explores the church's history and the church's truth claims. So I have back with me on part two of our episode diving into the Heartland Geography Model for the Book of Mormon, Jonathan Neville. Jonathan, thanks for coming back. Hi, good to be back with you. Yep, good to have you back. Uh, so part one, we, uh, me and Jonathan, we discussed the Heartland Geography Model, which is sort of centered around like the Great Lakes region in sort of mm -hmm. North America. Uh, we talked a little about sort of your background, your research into Book of Mormon and other topics. Yeah. We also had a good discussion about like civil dialogue between people who might mm -hmm. disagree or, or have uh, different views when it comes to be it, you know, the translation or geography models that we yeah. need to find a way to uh, talk about our differences without being disagreeable, yeah. to try not to be too yeah. contentious while having these uh, important topics and talking about our differences and challenging mm -hmm. each other. And I think that's something that you and me both share is we want to explore the strengths and weaknesses and the, the arguments and the evidence for either geography model or whatever the topic may be, but we don't want to exactly. create enemies, you know, create the us yeah. versus them. Well, and part of that is, you know, we talked about clarity, charity, and understanding. Yeah. Not persuasion, convincing, or any of that stuff. And, and I think the understanding is so important that everybody should understand why people think they, what they do without feeling compare, compelled or coerced to seek agreement or everybody has to agree with me. And, and yeah. that's totally yeah. my attitude. I'm fine with people believing whatever they want. I love you know, that. Whether they're in the church or out of the church, it, none of that matters to me. I just like people to make informed decisions. I totally agree. You know, in yeah. my academic uh, study and research, I'm not an academic, but as I've looked over uh, evidence and uh, you know books like from John Sorensen or Brant Gardner I had been more convinced and compelled towards Mesoamerica I find the convergences right. and correspondences um, you know pretty com convincing I thought Jerry Grover's research on geology in the Book of Mormon uh, I had leaned more towards I think Mesoamerica was a good uh, geographical setting for a historical sure. book or having to shift some paradigms mm -hmm. however I'm extremely open-minded to the heartland geography model and I don't feel necessarily threatened by looking into it <laughs> yeah. i always feel yeah. that well if there's a better model if there's better evidence um and if there is good stronger arguments for that then like mm -hmm. i'm happy if the book born took place in mesoamerica or if it took place in heartland yeah. like yeah. if it happened in either place that's awesome that's kind of that's the way right. i feel that's right and i feel like i want to i want to fully understand and i feel like in part one we talked about your view of like if joe smith um knew where the book mormon took place and you mm -hmm. believe that Joseph Smith uh, viewed North America as where the Book of Mormon took place. And then we talk a lot about the, the Hill Camor as well in part right. one. And I think you right. talk a little about like the Hopewell and Adena civilizations mm -hmm. and a little bit about the, the geography. But I want to I want to fully understand sort of your case and your views and what convinces okay. you for Heartland. Um, sure. But then also in, in this part, I want to bring up some of the criticisms or the challenges uh, that would go against the Heartland geography model. Sure. The thing, if right. somebody were to uh, believe in the Heartland geography, they might feel like, well, a lot of people bring up a lot of issues going against it. If I'm going to change my geography model, then I want to have <laughs> compelling answers to some of these yeah, issues sure. that people would bring up. Right. Uh, so it's right. not going to be me trying to do any gotchas or put you in a corner. Right. It's not going to be a debate. Uh, but to ask either questions that I have, and I've also asked listeners or other scholars what are some questions that you would bring up sort of challenging the heartland sure. geography model so i think that's great good. as we talked last time for decades i went along with uh, brant gardner and and john Sorensen and jack welch and all those guys too 
So yeah. I totally get yeah. where you're coming from. And it, it wasn't until the things we'll talk about today too that I changed my mind. And I confronted all the same questions as I went through this transition, let's call it, or sure. a conversion or whatever, <laughs> whatever the term is. It's just, in my view, it's just a, a better answer. So I've also put out uh, like a, a message for any sort of Mesoamerican experts who would have more expertise and more knowledge, who, who would want to have more of a formal discussion or debate with Jonathan, uh, mm -hmm. really going depth in some of these topics. I, I've, yeah. you know, given that I volunteered that they could come on and, and have the dialogue, mm -hmm. you're open for that. And I think people sure. just want to have clarity. I think it's good to be informed yeah. and let's just, let's exactly. talk about it. Because a, a lot of people I've noticed can be so dismissive towards the heartland <laughs> yeah. model yeah, and it, it's very very infectious and yeah. i've even noticed myself maybe in the past year i just never really considered the heartland geography yeah. model but i kind of feel yeah. like i came from partly a place of ignorance that i don't i don't know a massive ton about it compared to mesoamerica right. and i'm interested right. to hear why people have moved from mesoamerica towards heartland uh okay. and let's try to understand their arguments their perfect reasons. yeah perfect Love so it. where i wanted to begin before we jump into you know, criticisms or challenges for any people that missed part one could you give maybe a five to ten minute summary if that's possible what is sort sure. of your case for heartland be it you know hilkmore uh you know archaeology evidence mm -hmm. i mean we could talk a little about your map as well for any people's but why do you believe yeah. that the book of mormon took place in the heartland of north america versus you know mesoamerica or another geography model okay Okay, good. Well, it really, the fulcrum is, or what I call the pin in the map, is Camorra. And, and is the Camorra in New York, or is it somewhere else? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the the Maisel model you're talking about would put it in Mexico, but other people put it in Baja or Peru or South America, or even Myanmar, apparently, in Southeast Asia, or Thailand, even. And right. so th the key for me is Camorra is either in New York or it's not in New York. It, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter whether they say it's in Mexico or one of these other places, because the reason I, I think it was in New York is because that's what has always been taught by the prophets. And I made a little whiteboard, a little summary of, of the history of Camorra. Okay? okay. So hopefully you can all see this. But the um, the first thing in 1823, when Moroni first visited Joseph Smith, according to his mother, Moroni said the, the record is in the hill of Camorra, three miles from your house. So the first time Joseph Smith ever learned about Camorra was from Moroni directly that first night. And then in 1827, one time he was coming home from Manchester and he came home late and his parents asked him where he was and he said he received a severe chastisement. And his father started getting all mad about who chastised you? I want to have a word with them. And he said, calm down, dad. It was Moroni. As I was passing by the hill Camorra, he stopped and told me I needed to get going and it's time to start getting the plates. This was in the winter of 1827. And then in 1829, these aren't all the incidents, but these are just some of the major ones. Mm -hmm. In 1829, when David Whitmer picked up Joseph and Oliver from Harmony, Pennsylvania, to bring him to his home in Fayette, they passed the guy along the side of the road, and he was the messenger who had the plates. And David Whitmer asked him if he wanted a ride. And, and the guy said, no, I'm going to Camorra. And David Whitmer always remembered that because it was the first time he ever heard the word Camorra. And he asked Joseph who it was, and Joseph Smith told him it was one of the three Nephites. Uh, in 1830, Oliver Cowdery and Parley Pratt went on a mission to the Lamanites. And they taught people, it's in Parley Pratt's uh, autobiography, they taught people that it was from the hill Camorra, the plates came from the hill Camorra, which was called Camorra anciently by Moroni. And then Heber C. Kimball, when he joined the church in 1832, he went to see the Hill Camorra because he had known about it. And he said the, he could still see the embankments around the hill at that time in 1832. Last time, I think we talked about how there's just one little segment of it left. But um, and I had that painting where I showed it. Mm -hmm. But Heber C. Kimball saw the embankments. And at least in 1832, he had been told about it. And then, of course, in 1835, um, we had letter seven which is where Oliver Cowdery wrote about Camorra and said it was a fact that the hill in New York is where the last battles took place and the repository and all that. And then in 1842, Joseph Smith wrote the letter that's now DNC 128, um, verse 20. And that's the one where it says, Glad Tidings from Camorra, a book to be revealed. And the reason that's significant is 
he said it was a book to be revealed. So he hadn't gotten the book yet. And it was, yet he was referring to Kimura, which corroborates what his mother said all along. The other aspect of that is that when it, if it was glad tidings from Kimura where he got the, the plates, he wouldn't have been referring to a hill down in Mexico. The glad tidings didn't come from Mexico. They came from the hill in New York. Now, I, I know the people who don't believe Kimura is in New York say, well, he was kind of incorporating this tradition that had been developed. Yeah, later retrofitting back. I think, and we talked yeah. about that, I think quite thoroughly, sort of like the arguments challenging Kimura in New York in the in the last episode. Right. So I don't want to rehash yeah. that again, but we did. Sure. If people are wondering um, why I haven't brought up certain points here, we talked about that quite thoroughly in, in the last episode. Yeah. Okay. All right, so the next part, the next little... Uh, whiteboard i have <laughs> but you would you would see the hillcomore in new york as uh one of the strongest reasons uh in favor for the book Mormon taking place in, in the heartland well, of yeah. america sure well and, and this, that's why i call it the um the pin in the map because with Kimura in new york there's a wide range of possibilities beyond that some people say the whole book of mormon took place in western new york and other people i've heard some say it took place along the east coast down into delaware other people say it took place all the way out to um, Ohio and Illinois and Iowa, you know, the Nauvoo area. Other people say, well, encompass all of North America. And I know of some people that say, well, Camorra's in New York, but most of the events took place in Central America. Mm. And of course, originally with, with Orson and Parley Pratt and Benjamin Winchester, they thought that Lehigh landed in Chile. So he, they had the whole hemispheric model, but it was right. always based on Camorra in New York. And so that's what I grew history. up with as well. I don't know about you. I grew up yeah. believing in hemispheric model. <laughs> <laughs> I did too for, for a while. And then after, that's why when I learned the, the Meso limited geography, I said, well, that makes a lot more sense. You know? Yeah, I think that's the one thing both Heartlanders and Mesoamerican uh, proponents have in common is they both agree yeah. that the Book of Mormon, if it took place, it had to be more of a limited geography. It, sure. it couldn't really yeah. work as Book of Mormon lands being the entire you know hemisphere of North, yeah. Central, South America. Exactly. Exactly. And so I, I felt like um, when I first got into this, we went through the history of how I got into this last time, but I kind of came up with three basic principles for understanding the Book of Mormon. And the first one, well, the first one on my little whiteboard is, if Camorra is in New York, where is everything else, right? And that's the, the key issue. If Camorra is in New York, could it be in Central America? There's I know people who make a plausible case for that. John Sorensen dismissed it as the, the, the kind of a sci-fi notion, you know, almost delusional to think that because of the distances. But there's people who think it's uh, a possibility. But I came up with three keys for interpreting the Book of Mormon when we read it. And the first is that they use rivers when they moved around, like all ancient people do. You know, when we talk about the distances involved, the Mesoamerican model is based on assuming everybody was walking, mm -hmm. whereas the Heartland model is based on partly walking and partly using rivers which seems natural. The next one is lands northward and southward are relative terms, not proper nouns. And so when you read the text, you can say, well, the land northward had to be here. Well, it depends on the speaker and the time they were talking about. And it's, it's we could do the example. Like where they're and, geographically um, located at the time they're making that statement. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So right. in England, you'd have Manchester and London could be land northward or southward, depending if you were further north or further south, right? Right, right. But if I'm north of Manchester, then Manchester would then be, you know, land southward. Exactly. Where I'm at. Exactly. Right. And the last one is, I think there is not one neck. And this is a, a one that uh, I think is pretty important because the, um, we, everybody asks me, one, one of the most qu common questions I get the first time is, where's the narrow neck of land? And I always say it's in Ether 1020, because that's the only place it's mentioned. They say, no, 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 it's all through the Book of Mormon. And when we go through it, it turns out there's a small neck of land, mm -hmm. and then there's a narrow neck. But it, there's only one narrow neck of land. And that, I explain all that in more detail in the book. But those are different terms, and I think they mean different things. And, and in fact, I went th back through to see how the phrase narrow neck of land was used in Joseph Smith's time. George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, those guys talked about narrow necks of land during the Revolutionary War and so on. And, and I think we talked about that last time, but it's it's important to realize that it didn't mean an isthmus between two continents, like the early people thought it was uh, the, the isthmus of Darien down in Panama. 
And then the Mazo guys now think it's part of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec in there. Somehow they they rationalize that into a narrow neck of land, which never made sense to me. That that was the one thing that always stuck with me when I believed that there was only one narrow neck. I didn't understand how the Sorensen model made sense, but now I think it does make sense, at least in for the heartland, right? assuming that different terms mean different things. And then the last thing I have on here is, and this is this might sound confrontational or <laughs> argumentative, but are we going to corroborate or repudiate the teachings of the prophets about mm -hmm. Camorra? Because there's been members of the First Presidency and General Conference that talked about Camorra being in New York, not to mention all the historical um, items. And so basically my approach is I wanted to see if I just took as a as an experiment Camorra, New York, and Zarahemla across from Nauvoo, which is in DNC 125, does that fit? Does the Book of Mormon describe that terrain? And and I concluded that it did. And that's why you have, I think you have a map you could pull up. Yeah, because... yeah. So so last time you talked about, so you believe it took place in the heartland and you believe that, uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit later with uh, challenges, but the the civilizations that the Nephites and the Lamanites um, correlate quite well with the Hopla, Hopewell civilization and the Jaredites with the Adena civilization. Adina. There might have been some overlap. Uh, but let uh -huh. me get up a map just so listeners can see, and you you feel like this map corresponds quite well with your sort of geography model. So maybe, yeah. uh, can you see that? I, I don't see it yet. No, oh, hold on. <laughs> okay, can we see it now? Okay, yeah, it's perfect. Awesome, so why don't you just briefly talk us through the the geography models or like the, the main locations like Kimura, Bountiful, uh, land northward, southward, your seas yeah. uh reverse okay so what one thing I, I would start with by saying that i didn't prepare this map and if i had i would not have shown the united states that way i would have shown it as a topographical map including canada and mexico <laughs> so um <laughs> very exclusive just united <laughs> states <laughs> yeah i know I, I this to me is kind of a political statement which i don't agree with but that's beside the point in terms of geography yeah so to start at the very bottom for those familiar with the United States, there's Florida, which is the panhandle, and then the extension, the southern extension of Florida. And right on the panhandle of Florida, it says Lehigh's Landing. Yep. Down here. That's roughly where, yeah, roughly along there is where we think that Lehigh landed, because we think he crossed the Atlantic Ocean. In other words, yep. he went down the east coast of Africa and across the Atlantic Ocean. And then um, where it says Nephi's Escape up there, mm -hmm. there's a couple of rivers that go up there. And um, I, I made the point in, in one of my books that um, Nephi said his brother's hearts were, his, were like Flint. One of these rivers is called the Flint River, and it's because the Indians always went there to get Flint. And it, that tells me that when he was going up the river, got the Flint, and it reminded him that his brothers were like Flint. It could also be an allusion to Isaiah, of course, but, but it, it's, it's just a coincidence, let's say, that he was going up Flint River when he talks about his brother's hearts being like Flint. And was it then called Flint River uh, during yeah. those times? Well, those times, we don't know what it was called. In Book oh, of Mormon sure. times? Later. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Later. The, the right. Book of Mormon never named it. But but I assume, like all ancient people, that they went up river. That's where right. you would go if you're trying to escape. Okay. So then they went up to where it says Nephi's Valley there in, in southern Tennessee. It's around the Chattanooga area today. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, a large... Um, well, there's, there's numerous archaeological, you know, settings all through this area that date to Book Mormon times. But there's a big place up there called Lookout Hill, which we think is significant in, um, in the Book of Mormon narrative and so on. And then you can see there's a river that goes kind of west and south from there, the Tennessee yep. River. Tennessee it's River. The city of Nephi, and it says um, Mosiah's escape, and then it goes north where the arrows are. Okay. And that, that we believe is the north flowing river that was between um, Zarahemla and the land of Nephi. Okay. Now, Illinois, there where the yellow is overall. Now, this, this map reflects the, the geography, let's say, for um, Alma forward, but not before um, King Mosiah joined up with the people of Zarahemla, because this represents the overall 
territory of the ne Lamanites in the south and the Nephites in the land northward. But the yellow part is designated by the Ohio River and the Missouri River. So that's that's the two rivers going along there. Okay. And then you come yeah. up Ohio the, here, Missouri that way. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then the 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 land of Nephi is pretty much what is currently Illinois, which your listeners may or may not be familiar with. It's if you look up the the river there where it says City Zarahemla, Manti, and Nauvoo. Nauvoo is in Illinois, the city Zarahemla is in Iowa across the river. Mm -hmm. But it was interesting that the Book of Mormon doesn't mention the city of Zarahemla until you get into Alma. So in the Book of Mosiah, which is where it, it talks about the, the people of Zarahemla, they were living in the land of Zarahemla, but it didn't refer to the city of Zarahemla. Oh, and so, I didn't realize they, that. They, what's that? I didn't realize that. So it doesn't refer to Zarahemla as being a city in Mosiah. It's not until yeah, Alma. Not until Alma. Huh. And and that makes sense because they were still, you know, developing their civilization and so on. Okay. But so so when they escaped from the land of Lehi to the land of Zarahemla, they weren't going to the city of Zarahemla, just the land of Zarahemla. And and that makes sense to me that there would be a north flowing river, like everybody talks about going down from Nephi to Zarahemla and up to Nephi from Zarahemla, which you would do along this river. Okay, then um, let's see. The Plains of the Nephites, that's in uh, what is today Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio. Mm -hmm. And it's, it was um, Joseph Smith himself who identified those as the Plains of the Nephites. We talked about that last time, I think. And then you can see where Zelf's Mound was. Uh, City Manti and Land of Manti, those were based on some accounts in early church history that claim that Joseph Smith identified those sites as the Land of of uh, Manti, not real well attested, just in two journals, as I recall, but still an indication. As far as the, the seas, you can see there's um, the sea north, West Sea North there in Michigan, which is uh, Lake Michigan today. The sea north, the sea south, and the sea east are the Great Lakes. And in, did you say last time that in the Book of Mormon, it refers to either a West, was it a West Sea South or a West Sea North? Yeah, West Sea South, the West Sea right. South. And on here we have we show that as the Lower Mississippi River, right? Okay. And that's where I, I said if you look on Google Earth, you can see that Great Depression there. And anciently it was part of the Gulf of Mexico, but it was filled in by the the um, silt from the rivers, the Mississippi, Missouri, Illinois, and other rivers coming down to uh, fill that in. And, and even today they're considered two different rivers. The Lower Mississippi is considered a separate river from the Upper Mississippi. And it's where they converge there, where it says the head of the river Sidon. That convergence point between those, the upper Mississippi and the Ohio River, there's a town there called Cairo, named after Egypt. Okay. Because Southern Illinois was called Little Egypt in, in early American history. And that's why you have Memphis along there, Cairo, and, and other Egyptian names along there, because people said, this looks just like Egypt. And the Nile River, except it flows south instead of north like the Nile does. And it's interesting in, in Illinois, Cairo, Egypt, the local people call it Cairo, not Cairo, because <laughs> for whatever reason, that's how they pronounce it. But what I pointed out also is that in the Old Testament, there's there's three places, one in Nahum and, and two in Isaiah, where they refer to the Nile River as a sea. They use the Hebrew word for sea to refer to the river. And it, the Hebrew, if you look up in the in the concordance, the Hebrew concordance, that term for sea means a mighty river as well as the sea. And, and obviously the Mississippi River is a mighty river. In fact, anciently, or not even anciently, before they built the dams, in flood season, it could be 100 miles across, which is bigger than the Sea of Galilee, right? So um, anyway, that's, You're that's saying the, that's the, the Nile River in in africa in, in hebrew it could be translated as uh sea even though it's like a a large river and that could be the same for the mississippi is that what you're saying yes exactly okay. yeah okay so so the last thing on here is it shows the land of bountiful kind of going up to the northeast a little bit yep and that's the ohio area and then continuing back up there toward through the sea south you end up going up to western new york where the hill is 
Okay. Now, see, he he has indicated on here a small neck of land, narrow passage, narrow neck, narrow. Um, yeah, narrow neck. Another narrow neck. Is is that your narrow neck where you would have it without agreeing? Well, with this? I I'm okay with it. I didn't propose that. The guy who made this map propose that and it, it, lots of lots of heartlanders agree with that but we all recognize too that there's dozens if not hundreds of possible scenarios here mm. because of the vagueness of the text you know when it when it refers to a, a, a narrow neck between the land north and the land southward if it's a relative term it could be anywhere right so no. these are this map is it was based on one that I did, but it also has some refinements by the the people who did this map. It's a little different from mine, but it's not that big of a deal. I'm fine with it. One okay. last thing to point out too on this, if we go back to the land of Nephi down there, yes, and it says gold, copper, and silver. Everybody mm -hmm. in the United States, when they think of the gold rush, they think of San Francisco, right? But the first gold rush was in eastern Tennessee and, and western North Carolina. There's a massive gold rush there in the 1800s. And these mines have been, these minerals have been mined from ancient times. There's there's ancient uh, gold and silver and copper mines there. So when Nephi talked about having all these materials, they were readily available right there. Okay. On, on the other hand, up, up in northern Michigan, you can see it says, copper mines at the very top of the map at the Great Lake up there. Yep. Up here. It says copper mines. And that's because they were ancient copper mines too, dated back to Jaredite time periods. And just for fun, I even brought you a, to show you a piece of the kind of copper you can pick up off the ground there. This yeah, is maybe I'll unshare the screen so we can oh yeah. Okay, good better. idea. Yeah. Okay. This is a chunk of copper. You, you can, might be able to see the copper in there. Uh huh. And this was just make sure I get it right. This is this is pretty much solid copper just sitting on the ground up in up Upper Michigan. And it was widely abundant. The Hopewell used it extensively as well as the Adena. And you could see you could you could pound it out or you could melt it down either way. So I, I just happened to see that on my shelf and I thought, oh, maybe your viewers would like to see some copper from Upper Michigan. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> that's what it looks like. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Well, okay. Well, so um, when we when we come to geography questions, it might be easier uh -huh. if I maybe put up the map again, uh, for sure. yourself and also for for listeners to answer some of that. But I I appreciate um you sort of sharing your case for Heartland, um, looking mm -hmm. at your map, trying to understand it. Uh, we'll maybe get into some of the things with the geography. So I'm gonna sort of go through either criticisms or challenges leveled against okay. the Heartland geography model. Yeah. Um, so in part one, you know, just to recap, you talk about that you believe that Joseph uh, believed that the Book of Mormon took place in, in North America. Uh, right. You know, I think you refer to the Wentworth ladder and also the missionaries, you know, going to the Lamanites like in Missouri or Illinois. Right. Uh, I think we talked a little about self and we talked about how a lot of apologists would point to the articles in the Times and Seasons. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, or people like, you know, John Taylor, Orson Pratt, uh, referring to the Stevens and Catherwood's book about the, right. the ruins in Central America, that this is evidence mm -hmm. for the Book of Mormon. And although right. he was a named editor, you don't believe you that don't he believe really it. reviewed it or authorized or necessarily right. sanctioned. Um, I want to get your thought on the Bernheisel letter. And before mm -hmm. you respond, I might just read it for any listeners who are like, like what what the heck is this? Um, and then <laughs> you can bring you can it up of... on the screen if you want to. Uh, oh, do you have it? Um, yeah, I, can maybe I do. do. That after. If you have it. So I have on here, this is like um, a thank you letter uh, purportedly written right. by Joseph Smith. You can dispute this. I want to get your take on it. Uh, yeah. It's after he received the two copies of their books, uh, the volume book, Incidents of Travel in Central America, Chavis and Yucatan by John Lloyd Stevens and Frederick. Catherwood, and if you have the letter, yeah. we can I read did. what it yeah, says. Yeah, share then... the screen. Yeah, yeah. I... Um, let okay. me just. See. You should be able to now. Yeah. Okay. This is. The... I pulled this up because I knew you wanted to ask about it, and so, this is the Bernheisel letter right on the Joseph Smith papers. Mm -hmm. Can you see it? Okay. Yes. Okay. So you could read it off of here, but you can see that this is the actual letter right here that we're looking right. at. 
and then the text is on the the right side mm -hmm. did you want to go ahead and read it or yeah sure i'll i'll read it okay. quickly so it says Great. uh dear sir so this is written in navu november 16th 1841 Dear sir, I received your kind present by the hand of Wilfred Woodruff and feel myself under many obligations for this mark of your esteem and friendship, which to me is the more interesting as it unfolds and develops many things that are of great importance to this generation and corresponds with and supports the testimony of the Book of Mormon. I have read the volumes with the greatest interest and pleasure and must say that of all histories that have been written pertaining to the antiquities of this country, it is the most current or the most correct, luminous and comprehensive. And that's probably the most relevant part of the latter. So if this is coming from Joseph Smith, and I'll get your response to this, but somebody might say that, is this not Joseph Smith responding to receiving this by, uh, what was his name? Bernheisel? Bernheisel, uh, yeah. Bernheisel, these two volumes. And Joseph is saying that, um, that this corresponds this supports the testimony of the book of mormon and if he did write this then does this go against joseph viewing north america as the only place the book of mormon could have taken place that this would support that he was open to it occurring also in central america so what is right. what is your response to this okay well and it turns out i wrote a whole chapter about this letter in my first book oh wow <laughs> because because uh, i knew it was such a critical topic yeah because the point i would make is if joseph wrote this himself um then this would probably lend support that he he would have been open to it occurring in central america right. and i think yeah. a lot of sure. apologists and scholars we didn't talk about this in the last episode but a lot of them would use this to support that yeah. joseph believed um pretty much everywhere supported book more geography if it was right. north central or south america yeah okay so there's there's uh, my whole discussion of this would be obviously longer than we're going to take but i can kind of summarize it Sure. First off is who wrote the letter, and we know Joseph Smith didn't write it. When I wrote my book, I asked the church history department whose handwriting it was, and they said they didn't know. But in the interim, in the last few years, they did identify it as John Taylor's handwriting. So John Taylor was the scribe of this letter. So right there, we, we can't say Joseph Smith wrote the letter. The question is, did he dictate it, or did someone else write it? So I want to give a little background to this whole Stevens and Catherwood thing. First off, uh, Wilfred Woodruff visited John Bernheisel in New York and on his way to Nauvoo. And got, he mentioned in his journal that he got these uh, these two books. And, and Bernheisel gave him $40 as a down payment on some real estate also. And so on his in his journal, Wilfred Woodruff, when he was on the, the riverboat and on the way to Nauvoo, he talked about reading these books and how much he loved them, how impressed he was. And Wilfred Woodruff was a little unique in, among church leadership at the time because he loved history. He read other books by uh, Stevens. Stevens had gone on a journey to Egypt, I think it was. Um, I, I made the note here anyway. And so, so can I just interrupt you one we sec? Yeah. Um, I'll edit this out. Your, I don't know if it's your monitor. It seems like it's shaking a lot. Is it? Oh, it shouldn't be, but... I don't know if it's oh just... it is if I lean on the table it does right. okay <laughs> okay I, I, good I'm glad you caught that I'll just lean away from the table <laughs> right because I was like trying to figure I was like what is going on here yeah it, just, like, wow. really on. I have never noticed that before <laughs> I've done so many the last part but it, it looked yeah. like it was just shaking I was like is this I is this my this... connection no, no, it's you, it was me leaning on the table. I, I never noticed that before, so <laughs> I'll I'll stay away from the table. How's that? <laughs> Sorry, All right, you can. Okay, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll just start back with Wilfred Woodruff. Right. So Wilfred Woodruff uh, got these two books from Bernheisel, along with the forty dollars for the uh, real estate. Mm -hmm. And on his trip out to Nauvoo, he wrote in his journal about reading these books and how much he loved them. He thought they were fantastic. Right. Fact, so Woodruff received them from Bernheisel. First, yeah, what you're saying. Bernheisel gave them to Woodruff to give to Joseph Smith. Okay, right. And so he said um, something he's, when he was writing about it. I'll just read you what he said because I think it's pretty interesting. Uh, and what date was it? Was it like around the same time? This was in September of 1841. Yeah, so this okay. is on his way to Nauvoo. Yeah. The Bernheisel letter was written from Nauvoo in November. Right. This, so this was in September. He says, I spent the day reading the first volume of Incidents of Travel in Central America by Stevens, 
the author of Incidents of Travels in Egypt, Arabia, Petra, and the Holy Land. Um, I felt truly interested in this work for it brought to light a flood of testimony and proof of the Book of Mormon in the discovery and survey of the city Copan in Central America. And then he, he said it was truly interesting. And then later he says, a couple of days later, he says, I perused the second volume of Stephen's travels in Central America uh, in the ruins of Palenque and Copan. It is truly one of the most interesting histories I have ever read. And what I mentioned before, Woodruff was known for reading history. He just loved to read about history and places. So then in his journal, he talks about arriving in Nauvoo on October 6th. And the people he met, he was moving into his house, getting supplies and so on. And the first time he mentions meeting with Joseph Smith was on October 31st, uh, which is a little surprising because either he didn't meet Joseph Smith before then, and or he did and just didn't put it in his journal, which would be surprising because he did list, you know, meeting Brigham Young and others. But then he says on the 31st, uh, Sunday, I met with the presidency in 12 at Hiram Smith's office, spent most of the day in council. Joseph severely reproved Benjamin Winchester for getting out of his place and doing wrong. And then they continued. The next day he was sick and he was sick in bed for four or five days. But on the 5th of November, he says, I wrote a letter to Dr. Bernheisel. This is Wilford Woodruff. Mm -hmm. And then um, he attended the city council and so on. So that's the last he mentions the Bernheisel or the book. So when I looked at that, I thought, okay, we, we can clearly see that Wilford Woodruff believes that these books were evidence of the Book of Mormon. And we see that on November 5th, he wrote a letter to Bernheisel. And so far as I know, that letter has never surfaced. We, you know, it's not in the church archives or anything. At least I've asked about it. No one knows about it. So I started thinking, well, what if Joseph Smith, who was obviously very busy during this time period, got the book, said, would you just write him a thank you note? <laughs> and so Wilfred Woodruff, in my view, wrote the thank you note and, and said, you know, thanks for the, the gift. And it's a great book. And it, uh, the things you just read earlier. And then gave it to John Taylor because John Taylor had to add the second paragraph about the land dealings. You know, this the second paragraph, I don't remember if we read that, but it said, in regard to the land referred to you, and, and the second part of the letter talks about these land transactions in Nauvoo. So I kind of envisioned uh, Wilfred was writing a letter to Bernheisel, just a thank you note, giving it to um, John Taylor, who added the part, who, who rewrote it in his own handwriting as part of the, the larger letter, and then added the stuff about the real estate and mailed that off. So you don't think it's possible that Joseph could have dictated and they they wrote for him? You think sure. it's most likely that's... that? So you say that that's possible. And the other possibility would oh, yeah. be, uh, my follow-up question would be, okay, let's say you're right and Joseph did ask them because, you know, he's busy being the prophet mm -hmm. and he's got lots of going on. What if he asked, right. you know, Wilford Woodruff, you read through it, you, you write the letter on my behalf, but would that still not show that maybe Joseph was still open to it? Or would Joseph not have, corrected um them writing back that letter that this is sort of like evidence that corresponds with you know the, the testimony for the book of mormon yeah yeah okay uh, and that, we, that gets into the second phase of this whole discussion which is the contents of the letter itself mm -hmm. so whether wilford woodruff wrote it or joseph smith wrote it i think woodruff did because he expressed the same sentiments in his journal but let's say that he didn't but it says what does it say i'll read it again it says uh, corresponds with and supports the testimony of the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. That's what he said. He didn't say, is the Nephite people. And if you think about it, in, in their times, they perceived the Book of Mormon as describing a large civilization. And in, in that sense, it did correspond with and support the testimony of the Book of Mormon about the Lamanites and, the, well, the Jaredites and the Lamanites covering the entire continent, the, all the land. Because remember, and this is where it got, it, it's a little bit confusing too for people. The, the hemispheric model makes sense if you consider post-Book of Mormon times. Yes. It doesn't make yeah. sense for just the Book of Mormon. Right. And so the existence of people throughout the hemisphere, even, including the ruins in Central America, does corroborate the testimony of the Book of Mormon that people came over and inhabited the land, right? And it, particularly the Jaredites. Because the Jaredites said they expanded throughout the the land and so i i see this as 
him saying, okay, it corresponds and supports the testimony of the Book of Mormon. Didn't say anything about the geography of the Book of Mormon at all. Okay. And then, the, and then there's one other little tidbit of this that I think is kind of interesting because if you look at what he said here again, it says, um, uh, uh, okay, I must say that of all the histories that have been written pertaining to the antiquities of this country, how many histories had been written? As far as we know, you know, Humboldt wrote a little bit about it, but other than that, Stevens and Catherine were, were the main ones who ever wrote about that area. But it says, of all the histories that have been written pertaining to the antiquities of this country, what is he talking about there? And there were several histories written about the antiquities of the United States. Josiah Priest, and uh, who was also quoted in the Times and Seasons later, and others. And when he says, pertaining to the antiquities of this country, I thought, I wonder what he's talking about there. And so I looked through the Stevens and Catherwood book, and I found the only place in there where it talked about a flood and light together, the way um, Wilfred Woodruff did. And that was talking about North America, the ruins in North America, <laughs> if you go to that page. And certainly the, the, most of the book was all about their travels in Central America, but they did have a section where they talked about the ruins and antiquities in North America. And so you could interpret this where he says, all the history had been written pertaining to the antiquities of this country as referring to the United States in the first place. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's a lot of ways to look at it, but those are a few. Um, so overall, when I look at this, I, I say, First, there's no indication Joseph Smith ever read these books, but let's say that he actually approved of the letter. Right, right. I, I don't see that as evidence of any kind of geography in any way. The other thing I, I noted here was that this was the third or fourth of correspondence between Joseph Smith and Bernheisel. And I looked at the previous letters and they all differed materially from this one. This one has indicia of Woodruff's other correspondence as well. So getting back to that. But let's say that for purposes of discussion that Wilfred Woodruff either didn't write the letter or if he did write it, he wrote it with the approval of Joseph Smith, right? Yeah. yeah. It still doesn't say anything about the geography anyway. So it's kind of so, a good point. In my view. Last follow-up because I don't want to spend too long on this because there's yeah. so many things I want to bring up. What if sure. somebody were to say that one this um if let's just say for sake of argument let's just say uh let's just say joseph did approve of this letter okay. whether or not he wrote it okay. or wilford woodruff uh what if okay. somebody were to say one if it if it talks about that this what's the wording corresponds with and supports the testimony of the book of mormon what if somebody were to okay. say okay it doesn't explicitly refer to uh book of mormon geography but it's kind of like say implied from it someone might say like sure. reading between lines that could be what what it means yeah um, right. So somebody could then, could you understand why someone might interpret that as if this did come from Joseph, if he approved right. it, sure. why he might have not known for certain where the book more took place, that he was also considering uh, Central America. And when it talks about uh, at the bottom um, of all histories that have been written pertaining to the antiquities of this country, but this was occurring in Mesoamerica that maybe in other statements when Joseph refers to like the Native Americans in this country that it's not exclusively to the United States but could also include Mesoamerica. Yeah, what's, sort of I, your, what's your quick response to, to that? My, my quick response is I'm fine with multiple working hypotheses. I like that. Me too. Fr frankly, I believe this interpretation for decades. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't until I really looked into it. I said, well, wait a minute, who really wrote this letter and what does it really say? And it doesn't say or what people have um, added. People have added a lot of content to it that isn't there. And right. It gets back to my faith model. You know, there's the facts, assumptions, inferences, theories, and hypotheses. Interpretations, so, yeah. So yeah. the letter is a fact. Everything beyond that is assumptions and inferences. And I, I readily acknowledge there's different ways to interpret it. I have no problem with that. Okay. So yeah. I just... To me, it doesn't it doesn't make sense to interpret it the other way that I did for many years. So, okay, that's fine. No, that's good. I think um, I think, um that was quite clear was and helpful. Quite... So, let's talk a little about the Zelf story. Um, because okay. I find this video on Book of Mormon Central, and I was like, huh, yeah, okay, I want I want to bring this up with Jonathan because it was new to me. Um, so uh, Heartlanders would view 
you know, they're, they're traveling from Zion's camp. They're going to Missouri. And this is in Illinois, I believe, a mound where right. they find a skeleton. Find a skeleton. Um, yeah. And this is attributed that Joseph said this. There's many people who write it down. Some are contemporary. I think some are also later as well. Right. But there's multiple accounts <laughs> which support that likely Joseph Smith had a vision of someone called Zelf. Some accounts say that he referred to this as like, you know, traveling the plains of the Nephites. So I'm just going to read. This is what scripture central had to say sure. uh, i want to get your thoughts in this okay so yeah. you talk about how there's different journal accounts or recollections they said in the pre-publication manuscript of the history of the church so this is when joseph was alive that they they sort of compiled these different accounts that have been written at this time um yeah. and the words nephites hilkamore and last great struggle were apparently crossed out and they have this on a video and they they show it yeah. uh the implication being that maybe joseph did not say uh these are the planes and the fights or this was the last final battle or hilkmore um that people would use well, just let, let, let me just stop you the planes of the nephites was a separate thing that was a letter that he mm -hmm. wrote that was so to that, emma wasn't it yeah so that, okay. that one Sorry. was established okay. but but you're right about the other things yeah okay thanks for that cl clarification um, so, so the question is, um, why does the pre-publication manuscript, which um, I'm guessing Joseph might have edited or one of his scribes, <laughs> um, why during his lifetime does that cross out um, the Hilkamore last final battle? And does this well, really then support that Joseph believed that this was uh, where Book of Mormon geography took place? Yeah. Well, I don't think anybody has any idea whether Joseph Smith ever read that history, and certainly not who crossed it out. Right. You know, so you, yeah, that's that's an, again a multiple working hypothesis. You could hypothesize that Joseph Smith crossed that out, but there's no evidence of that. Mm. And it's it's you know reconciling all those journal accounts led to lots of different opinions about it because you had Wilford Woodruff who's you know, the reason I wanted to read from Wilfred Woodruff's journal is his journal was the most complete that we have. And so for many incidents in church history, we only have his journal to rely on. For example, the statement that the Book of Mormon is the most correct of any book, that came only from Wilfred Woodruff's journal. Nobody else reported that. And so if we only had his account of Zelf, we would be looking at it as, well, this is the gospel truth. But, you know, <laughs> just like we put the, the quote... Um, I told the brethren that this is the most correct book. It's mm -hmm. all in first person, even today in the introduction of the Book of Mormon. But it came as a third person account from Wilfred Woodruff, and he wasn't even putting it in quotations. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we would have, if he was the only one that reported Zelf, we would have had Joseph Smith in first person saying, oh, that he recorded. But in this case, it made such an impression on the other people there that they all wrote their own accounts of it. And as, as people do, everybody wrote different aspects of it. To me, that corroborates the validity of the experience that Joseph Smith yeah. related to. Yeah. Um, but you can parse the words and say, well, maybe this, you know, maybe that. But the bottom line is, it was, he said he was known from the Rocky Mountains to the Hill Camorra for the East Sea. And the archaeologists since who have excavated that mound have said, yeah, there's artifacts in here from the Rocky Mountains all the way to the south and all the way east. So, and they date to the time period that Joseph Smith said it would. So, at least the the details that we can corroborate are all corroborated. The ones we can't corroborate is is Hillcomore really in New York or not, and and that's up to the interpretation. Okay. But in terms okay. of describing that who this was, how he died, and and the where the artifacts came from, that's all been validated. Right. Um. So a follow up to to Zelf. This is coming from Jerry Grover. So I am kind of sure. relating this second hand. Um, okay. When I did an episode with him, he brought up the Zelf mound and he said it's been archaeologically excavated. And when they, I think, dated the, the first skeleton that they found at the, the top of the mound. So this would have been, I suppose, the, the latest person there. Um, he said it dated to around, like, I think it was 91, uh, I think it was AD. Or a mm -hmm. ninety AD or so. Uh, yeah, I hope I'm, about right. I'm hoping I'm, I'm I'm accurate. Yeah. So if I'm remembering, remembering points, point. sorry, I think I can hear an echo. I don't, I don't hear it. Yeah, sounds fine. 
Okay. Um, so if I'm remembering his argument, I think the argument he made to me was that so if the first skeleton that they found, you know, at the top of the mine was did to around say 90 AD, uh, that Zelf most likely would have been around the same time period. And then he said that that would have been a time period in the Book of Mormon where there would have been peace, there, where there wouldn't have been war, you know, like after the Savior came. So okay. his argument to me, as I'm just recollecting, was yeah. that pointing to Zelf and, you know, th this mine that's been excavated doesn't support uh, Book of Mormon geography because mm -hmm. if that's where the Book of Mormon geography happened, if it was dated to, you know, the Zelf skeleton to its find around like 90 AD, there wouldn't have been wars at that time in the Book of Mormon, if if you get what I'm trying to say. But yeah, there no, could have been like northward say. migrations. I don't know if you've heard that argument. Um, yeah, I've heard the have a response to it. theory. The whole hinterland theory is the idea that these were some of the, if they were Nephites, as Joseph said, they were the ones that left to the north. Right. But they were yes. in the hinterlands, not in the main area. Well, the first response is they took Zelf's bone. And I, I don't know if they took his whole skeleton or not, but they took his thigh bone with him out to Missouri. Mm -hmm. But just by digging him up, he wouldn't have survived more than a few years, if that. His skeleton wouldn't have. So when the archaeologists went in, I think it was in the mid 1900, 1970-ish time frame. I don't remember the exact time they went in there. That was 150 years after they, they had already been digging into that mound. And I don't know what other grave diggers had been there, but it was very common for people to go around digging up these mounds looking for you know, artifacts and, and particularly for metal, for copper and stuff. So I don't know, by the time the archaeologists got there to do the dig, I don't know how much had already been excavated by other people, but we know for sure Zelf was no longer there. Yeah. So, you know, what was below Zelf, to me that corroborates Joseph Smith's account, because if below him was 90 uh, AD, then above him would have been more recent than 90 AD, right? So, but again, you know, I, people can interpret it different ways. He, they could. I don't know how far down in that mound they actually went. I know they haven't excavated the whole thing for sure, because I've been on it a couple of several times actually, and it's it's really a dual mound. It started off as two separate mounds, and as they got bigger and bigger, they kind of merged, and now there's a depression between them. But there's uh, they, they they only dug some sample digs in it, so there's still plenty there to be excavated if anybody <laughs> wants to go do it. But, you know, right. I, I think that's, uh, he makes a point that in 90 AD, maybe there weren't any battles, at least not recorded in the Book of Mormon. doesn't mean there weren't any battles. We okay. only have one, okay. less than 1% of the history, you know, so. Alrighty. Um, so we'll move on next to geography. And I'm just going to read some of these questions. I I do not dive deeply into Book of Mormon geography. I'm okay. I'm interested in it, but um, yeah. unfortunately, I'm not somebody who I think would want to dive into all 550 geographical references and sure. um co compare them. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I admire those people who do. Um, yeah. so well, the first question challenging the Heartland geography, and this is quite a common one, but why is there no mention of snow? So in in the Book of Mormon, I think Sorensen and Brad Gardner. I've read that a, a lot of the battles they claim in the Book of Mormon take place sort of more in like winter time or like between like say like the 10th or 11th month to like the third month of the year, which would have been like, you know, our our winter, you know, say like November to, to March, for example. Um, and the Book of Mormon mentions, I think it's when Tiankum slays Amalekiah, how they mm -hmm. were like fatigued from battle you know, because of the heat of the day and the labors. Right. Um, right. And somebody would say that, well, if they're having a battle sort of around winter time, but they're fatigued from the heat of the day, does this not support more of a sort of hot climate? And the follow-up question would be, if this took place in, you know, Heartland, would there not be sort of snow if they're having battles around this time period? Okay. Uh, what, what's your response to that? Yeah, the first response is when you how do you calculate what month of, of the year it was? And there's different ways to do that. So they I know how they do it because I've gone through the wars in the Book of Mormon and, and their book and all that stuff. And I, I don't have a problem with their calculation, but that's not the only one that's possible. Mm -hmm. So I, I challenged their their initial premise that it had to be in the winter time. This the second thing I would say is that even in the winter time, 
assuming it was in the winter time, when you're in a, in a battle, it's still the heat of the day. It's not, it's not, you're not hot because the sun's out. You're hot because you're fighting hand to hand combat. Right. Mm -hmm. And so regardless of the weather, even if it's raining, you're going to feel hot in a hand to hand combat. So that does, neither one of those arguments make much sense to me. The third part of this is the Book of Mormon doesn't talk about the weather at all. There's only one time where it talks about the famine when there, there was no rain. And then it talks yeah. about the nature of the climate. And, and it talks about multiple seasons, you know, in certain seasons. So there's more than two seasons, which in Mesoamerica, they have basically rainy and dry season. But so there are multiple seasons. There were times when they had disease because of because of insects. But they just don't talk about the weather. And then the, the, the fourth thing I would say is in the New Testament, they don't talk about snow either, except as a metaphor, which the Book of Mormon does. Nephi talked about snow as a metaphor, mm -hmm. except he used the term driven snow, which is different from the way the Bible uses the term snow. And driven snow to me is, is a more detailed metaphor than just snow, because in Israel, it, obviously it snows sometimes in Israel, but in the mountains. But typically, people aren't in the driven snow. It's not a heavy snow like you would have in the Midwest, or you know. And the other part of that is, I would say that the in the New Testament never mentioned snow. And and I I did the travels of Paul. I might have mentioned this before. And I took a tour through uh, Turkey. We woke up one morning to a blizzard. So I'm thinking, well, we must not be in the travels of Paul because he never mentioned snow, right? <laughs> and it's the same kind of an argument. So, you know, the old uh, saying that absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence, right? And so the fact that the Book of Mormon doesn't mention snow to me is a completely red herring. It's, it's an argument based on what they think it should have, Mormon should have included in there. But he didn't talk about the weather at all. He also doesn't talk about jungles, jays, or jaguars, right? Which are right. ubiquitous in Central America. So. I, to me, that it's just uh, it's really kind of a red herring argument. Mm, that's fair. Uh, out of curiosity, when do you believe the battles in your geography model? When do you think they likely did occur? Uh, what sort of time of year? Well, I th it would pr presumably be after the harvest, right? Because they needed everybody involved with the harvest, right? But when was their harvest? And then you say, well, September time frame. You could have battles in October, November. You could have battles in December. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, Native Americans lived all year round out in their long houses and stuff, and they went out hunting and in the snow and cold. I don't know that they wrote about it that much or even talked about it that much. But I, 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 I kind of like the way John Sorensen analyzed the text to figure out that they would have had battles when they were not either raising food or harvesting food. Yeah, some of that. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So I'm fine with that. But just because they had wars in the winter, I'm, I'm for purposes of discussion, let's assume they had them in the winter. Doesn't mean they had to talk about the weather, you know. Mm. Okay. Um, so next question on geography. This comes from. Uh, I think this comes from here. I'll, we'll we'll put the map back up for these next okay. couple of questions. So I'm going to share sure. the screen. So this question says, in past interviews, Jonathan has said that he doesn't support any current Heartland map, but has his own map where it occurred in uh, Tennessee, or at least the River Sidon is there. He has also stated that the only geographic feature he definitely supports is the Camorra location. Is that still his position? We did briefly go over your geography, but do you have a quick response to that question? Well, I, def I definitely agree that Camorra is in New York. As far as other Heartland maps, yeah, there's a there's a wide variety. Like this one is based on the one that I did in Moronis America, in my book Moronis America, but it has some differences than than what I had. So I, I wouldn't say that I disagree with this. It just isn't the one that I generated. Right. And and I think the rationale for the different locations of the uh, Black Swamp and the Narrow Neck, those are all plausible. It, it gets back to multiple working hypotheses again. Right. Yeah, there, there's some and, interpretation yeah. people have to make when it comes to, even if they agree generally on the geography, but there's yeah. maybe little details. And, and this gets back to, I we talked about this a little bit before too. The, the brethren who have talked about Camorra have all said Camorra's in New York, but they said we don't know where the other events took place. Mm -hmm. And that makes perfect sense because there's hundreds of possibilities. 
And and as as much as a little nuance of saying, well, if it says they traveled eight days, they had to go this far. Someone else says no, they had to go this far. Then it changes the whole geography. Right. So, and and I think we talked about how there's a hundred thousand mound sites still in North America, and there used to be ten times that many before they were destroyed. So you know, it's anybody's guess which one of these were Nephite or Lamanite. Okay. Uh, next geography question. I think this comes from Brant Gardner. So he says the battles in the Book of Alma have three fronts in two different wars. One is along the East Sea, one on the West. Then the second war is in the center. Since our Hamlet is along the Sidon, the Sidon can't be the West Sea. Where is that West Sea? That makes sense. Well, to answer that, I'd have to go through the text with him, you know, in, in detail what he's referring to. But as we pointed out here, in our view, the Sea West is the land south, or is the lower Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Now, whether whether they refer to the river going by the city of Zarahemla as the River Sidon or not, to me, that makes sense that that was the River Sidon. But the West Sea, I think in my book, I even I talked about them having battles by the West Sea South here. Right. Okay. But again, I'd have to go through the particular verses and answer that in detail. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, I think in the Book of Mormon, it talks about them at certain points, like wading or get going across the River Sidon. And I've right. heard some people bring up the criticism that, um, you know, the, the River Sidon and Heartland, uh, would they have been able to wade across it? Cause in Mesoamerica, uh, the river they identify for the River Sidon, certain times of the year, they they could wade across it. What's your... Yeah. What's your well, they could hear all these rivers they could wade across. In fact, one time I was doing a a fireside and I mentioned the Ohio River and one of the women said well I grew up in Ohio before they built the dams out there and in the summer you could walk across it it was just a big muddy strip nobody could live there because it was a river but people could go out there they drive their their jeeps or whatever across and that's what led me to conclude the Ohio River is a narrow strip of wilderness as well which was on that map because these rivers used to dry up in the summer okay. maybe not every summer but when they had a drought Okay, interesting. Um, yeah. So I'm going to move away from geography to criticisms about the heartland civilization. So like the Hope Valley, okay. Adena civilization. So the first sure. criticism is quite a common one is there's no evidence of writing that they found of the Hope Valley and Adena civilizations. Yeah. That's sort of like a common argument. And if, you know, it was uh, literate people in civilization, but there's no evidence of writing. Uh, then the Book Mormon people couldn't be the Hopewell or Dina civilization. Right. What's your response to right. that? Well, two responses. The first is evidence of writing is irrelevant if it's a different kind of writing. Like Mayan is not Reformed Egyptian. Mm -hmm. So the fact that there was, there was Mayan writing down there says nothing about Book Mormon civilizations. Mm -hmm. But the second thing is the from the very beginning of the Book of Mormon in, in Enos, he talks about how the, the Lamanites were determined to destroy their records all the way to the end in Moroni, or, or Mormon, I guess, says that they were going to destroy our records. That's why he had to get them from the hill Shem and take them to the hill Cumorah. And so throughout the entire Book of Mormon, the Lamanites were obsessed with destroying all the Nephite records. We don't have any record in the Book of Mormon of the Lamanites keeping records. The only indication that they had writing was there, there was an exchange of letters a few times, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But there's no indication that they they were keeping any kind of a written language in any form. In fact, when um, when uh, who was it? Coriantumer brought had this stone, you know, that he had, he had written on a stone. He couldn't talk, but he had the the big stone. Right. That, was, right. I that was such a unique thing that they made a, a point of saying, "Hey, there is this carved stone," but. <laughs> otherwise there's no mention of any carvings on any stones or any kind of records like that like you have in central america so if you read the, the book of mormon on its what it actually says you would not expect written language to have survived they only they made a big point of preserving their language on and their writings on the plates because those would be preserved but anything they wrote on whether it was bark or some kind of paper or any other temporary thing would have dissipated in the you know like the papyrus right. and so, so the the question would be if the nephites were engraving on stone then you would expect to find stones that had engravings on it but there's no indication that they did that 
And then there was the, except for the one stone, which was a Jaredite stone. There's no indication that the Lamanites were writing on anything other than these letters. So I, there, there was a time in the, the Book of Mormon studies when people were expecting there not to be any writing at all because the people of Zarahemla were illiterate completely. They had to re relate their um, genealogy from memory when they first met. The Nephites had writing, but it was King Benjamin mentioned that he had to instruct his, have his sons instructed in how to do writing and preserving records because right. it was kind of a priestly class kind of thing where. Uh, and I know that argument I think is also used in Mesoamerica because, like you said, the, the Mayan right. writing isn't, you know, the same as Reformed Egyptian. I think the, right. the response that Mesoamerican proponents would give. Is that um, the the reformed Egyptian was sort of like the priestly class, and they were preserving right. uh, the writing that they had, you know, back in Israel, yeah. you know, a mixture yeah. of Hebrew and also, you know, Egyptian. Right, and so just as there's no evidence of Egyptian or Hebrew writing in Mesoamerica, there isn't any in North America either. And on that sure. on that point, we we all agree, I think. Yeah, <laughs> but there wouldn't be any urgency of moving all the records to the Hill Camorra if the records were going to be laying around for people to find anyway. You know, so it seems to me that, that Mormon was pretty careful to point out that both Enos and, and at the very end, from the beginning to end, blame us were going to destroy the records. Just like remember when the Taliban took over in Afghanistan, and they destroyed all the Buddhas and everything. It's it's fairly common for and, and when the Spanish came to Mexico, they destroyed all those records. They just burned them all and yeah, melted them true. down. So that's a common thing in civilization. So I wouldn't expect to find any, certainly not any Nephite writings. Right. But on the other hand, you know, the the earthworks in North America were very sophisticated. You've probably seen some of those. I, I have a little um, booklet here. This was the Squire and Davis book from. Mm -hmm. um, and, and these are the plates where they show that, that they made where they show the art, the earthworks in North America. These were all discovered after the Book of Mormon was. Um, you can just show us some of them, but. You know, some of some of these were aligned with astrological, astronomical, I should say, um, events, moon events, and so on. Let's see if I can find that one in here. But they're very sophisticated, and they were replicated over large distances, and they had specific geometric shapes, you know, mm -hmm. like these. So it, it's difficult for me to imagine how a civilization could have replicated these things with these precise measurements and angles and everything over large distances if they had no writing, you know. Um, they wouldn't necessarily have been writing on plates, but they would have written on, you know, bark or whatever they had to write on, cloth maybe, because they would have to communicate distances and things over large distances, plus just planning it out and telling people where to go to be aligned with all this and doing the calculations. That to me sounds like they had some system of writing. Right, but it would right. be unrealistic. So the saying of like absence of like, evidence is not evidence of absence. You would see that yeah. even though there's no evidence of writing, that that doesn't mean that they're definitely definitively yeah. they had no writing. Yeah, well, yeah. And, and to me, these the sophistication of these earthworks is evidence of writing. Right. Me, okay. And mathematics. Right. But we don't have any physical evidence that we know of so far. Okay, that's fine. Curveball question. Uh, this is going to be a rapid fire one, but. I'll ask okay. it now. I've done a few episodes with uh, Jerry Grover, and mm -hmm. he's attempted a translation of the characters document. And I put up my right. hands, and I, I obviously there's no way I can <laughs> authenticate it. I think it's interesting. Right. Um, I think I definitely see that there are some strong correlations between some of the the characters because a lot of critics would say like this is just clearly deformed English, but right. you can see that some of the characters really do resemble like. Uh, some Egyptian hieratic or demotic and yeah. and his theory is he's compared it to like some Mayan glyphs for like some of the right. numbers to work out some of the dates and then some resemble Egyptian hieratic and demotic and yeah. it's, it's above my expertise there's no way I can authenticate it so <laughs> it's I'm very above everyone's expertise it. but somebody might say that um, if it's a legit translation that right. this supports uh the, the Mayan glyphs that he says he's found, that supports obviously right. Mesoamerica more than sure, it does Heartland. Um, yeah. have, you, have you looked uh, at his yeah. work on the characters document? Yeah, you have any, I've, I've seen any thoughts on it. I've seen about, if, if I can recall, about five different translations of that characters document. And they're all based on the initial assumptions. 
You know, there's some people say it looks like the Micmac characters, which were the, the tribe up in northeastern United States and Canada. I think I've heard um, yeah. Rod Meldrum mention that. Probably yeah, has, yeah, or Wayne May. Those, and they show they'll have the Micmac characters, and then they'll show how they are similar to the ones in the the characters document. I, I know of a guy who did a whole thing based on Egyptian. And another, I think, did a Hebrew version. He says, well, this looks like this Hebrew character. And Jerry sent it with the Mayan glyphs. So it's, it's another case of the facts are that character's document. Everything else is assumptions. Mm, yeah. And yeah, multiple working hypotheses. I mean, what can I say? I, I don't think that character's document was necessarily accurate to begin with. Yeah, that's one of the limitations. He, yeah. Yeah. And we can all see that the characters got smaller as they got towards the end, right? Yeah. So they were trying to cram it onto the sheet of paper. And then, you know, I guess there's a consensus that it was uh, John Whitmer whose handwriting it is in because of the mm -hmm. way characters was spelled. But did he copy another document? Did he do a, a graving on the place themselves and get it exact? We have no idea. So it's highly speculative in terms of its origin. We don't even know what part of the Book of Mormon it was from. If he copied it from the place, it would have been from the small place because that's what he was ascribed for. And uh, Jerry, I think, says it came from the bridge plates. Um, so, uh, uh, I, I should probably know this. I'm trying to remember. I think he, yeah. I think he believes it's a translation of, uh, like the first chapter of Mosiah that we've lost. Yeah. So yeah, that would be that's yeah from, from that's the bridge plates. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And and other people say no, it's it's First Nephi one one, and here's how I can show it. You know. So <laughs> I've just seen such a variety of translations of that. And I just think it's it's all interesting, but it's kind of irrelevant because it's, yeah, it, it's, it's all confirmation bias. If, if you believe it's Micmac, you can see Micmac. If you think it's mine, you can see mine. If you think it's Egyptian, you can see Egyptian. And you can make an argument. And if you but, think it's deformed English, you can find out as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If you're Dan Vogel, you can say, oh, this is just English and they just changed the light. Yeah, exactly. So Right. No, that, that's fair enough. Because I'm very, I'm interested, but I'm extremely tentative when it comes to yeah it's, it's gotten to me every time i see someone do a translation now i don't waste my time on it because i've seen so many of them and, and it's transparent that they're just confirming their bias so mm. okay so so next question about next question civilizations about so mm -hmm. this comes from uh brant gardner um because i want him i asked him a couple of questions that he'd like me to to ask you sure. so okay. use the adina as the uh, likely civilization for the Jaredites. Um, I'm yeah. trying to remember from last time, do you believe that the Jaredites were the Adena or do you believe that the Jaredites sort of participated in the yeah, Adena in the, culture and civilization? Yeah, I would see it, both the Nephites and the, the uh, Jaredites as participating in an existing culture. Right. I think we talked right. about that before, that when, when the Lehi landed, there was hunter-gatherers, but there was no nation. That's why I make the distinction between Lehi saying there would be no nation, but when Lehi left his brothers, he said he took, he named his siblings and so on, his sisters, and he said, and those who would follow me. So yes, that yes. implies there were more people. Right. And and that's consistent with the archaeology down there. So I have no problem with that. Okay. It's the same with the Adena and the Hopal. I mean, they were fairly widespread throughout the Americas and the Adena in North America, at least. And then you have the Olmec and others in the South. I think those are all affiliated with Jaredites. But so I would see the Hopewell as being um, Nephite-influenced or participating with Nephites, not, right. Right. not one for one identity. I think that's similar to the Mesoamerican uh, yeah, opponents totally. as well. So his question yeah. is, some modern archaeologists are not suggesting that they... So, um, no, I skipped this part. Um, let me start again. He says the Adena preceded the Hopewell in most sites is what was believed, but he says some modern archaeologists are now suggesting that they are only different stages of the same culture and not different people, kind of like pre-classic and like classic Maya, for example. Right, right. And he says the Book of Mormon always thinks the Jaredites to the land northward, so they shouldn't be all over the same places as the Nephites. So I think he's making two points there. So one, that they may not be too distinct cultures or civilization but just yeah. one and then the last point is the book of mormon links the jaredites to the land northward so they shouldn't be covering the same place as the nephites uh do you have okay. a, a response yeah to I, I, let's talk about those two separately because yeah the adena 
one of, one of the ways they identified Adena was they had these conical mounds that were more steep and, and ro rose kind of higher at a higher slope. Then the Hopewell had more broad. And they had some of the Hopewell sites are actually ancient Adena sites that the Hopewell took over. So that's why you can see how archaeologists just say, well, they're kind of all the same culture or they're just a, a migration or a, a evolution maybe into Hopewell. But that's consistent with the Book of Mormon too, because we know after Mosiah joined with the um, people of Zarahemla, we start seeing some of the Jaredite names, right? So we would expect there to be some overlap of those okay. two cultures. It could have been Coriantumr. Now this is interesting too, because in my he was view, Jaredite King wasn't he? And he, he was, yeah, he was. Well, he was the last survivor of the Jaredite, supposedly, right? right. But that's why I say that Mor Moroni made it real clear when he said he's writing about those who lived in this north country but he wasn't talking about the entire hemisphere or even the entire continent or the entire land mass however you want to describe it he was he specifically said he was writing about those in this north country and he was writing about the ancestors of ether essentially and so i think there were quote-unquote jaredites i guess maybe we talked about this last time but in my view jaredites is two different terms one is the direct descendants of jared and the yeah. other is everybody yeah. who came with Jared and his brother and, and their friends. Yes, you mentioned that yeah. last time. Yeah. So a broader definition of Jaredites would be everybody who came on those ships, which, I, in my view, they spread throughout the hemisphere, or at least down to Central America with the Olmecs. And, and you would believe similar for the, the Nephites. It's not ex exclusively yeah. just the descendants of Nephi, but all those who follow Nephi as well. Right, exactly. And I think that when Moroni wrote the book of Ether, he was only talking about those in this North country where he was living. Because he, you know, remember he's, according to Albert Cowdery, he said, Moroni said, the record was written and deposited not far from Joseph's house. So Moroni was near Joseph's house when he wrote this record. And Mormon was when he bridged it because of the New York Camorra and all that stuff. So he was only talking about those who lived in that area. And when you look at the number of Jaredites who actually died at Camorra, it's less than 10,000. And, and I know that's a, we talked about that last time, I think, too. So I think, I I think so. That up. But so to, to answer Brant's question, I don't see a one to one correspondence between Nephites, Hopewell, Jaredites, Adena. They were, the Adena was an older culture that corresponds, or let's say converges on the Jaredite uh, culture. And the Hopewell were there in, in different pockets, but the Nephites kind of joined them and they joined the Nephites. Okay. So. I don't have a problem with any of that. Here's an interesting th thing, though, the development of the two Camorras and the Mesoamerican thing. Because in um, in the 1900, I think it was actually published in 1909, there was a book called Camorra Revisited by Charles Shook. It was a disaffected, I think he was RLDS. Mm -hmm. And he made the case that the Book of Mormon couldn't be true because we it talks about two ancient civilizations, but we all know there was only one. That was his argument in the early 1900s. Well, the, the term Hopewell wasn't applied to that civilization until 1902. And, it, and the, I think the Adena were a little after that. So archaeologists hadn't identified these two different civilizations at the time Charles Shook wrote his book. Oh, at the time it was just oh, one civilization. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And so he okay. thought the Book of Mormon yep. had to be a false history. And then when we had the Adena and Hopewell as two separate civilizations that correspond in the time, that kind of re- reestablish the validity of the Book of Mormon. But in the meantime, people were responding to the criticisms of the Book of Mormon, and it was Stebbins and Hills, the two RLDS our, our guys, we think we talked about them last time, who developed this, uh, this map showing Camorra down in Mexico because they said it had to be in Central America, Camorra's too far away in New York, so it had to be down here. So they actually published a map showing Camorra in Mexico, which is basically the same map that Brent Gardner and those guys use today. Um, they would quibble about that because theirs is their Camorra is maybe 50 miles to the east or something, but conceptually it's the same map. Whereas I look at that and I say, well, Charles Shook, his anti-Mormon book was wrong because there really were two ancient civilizations in North America that were distinguishable. Okay, right. Uh, enough softballs. Uh, next uh, question. Um, <laughs> so this comes, I, I read through a fair article by Tyler Livingston, I, th I think he's yeah. a scholar and apologist. Um, I, I right. haven't really listened to him or read that much of him, um, but yeah. some points he made in an article uh, critiquing 
the Hopewell and Adena civilization. So he says the Hopewell civilizations, they, it was more like small villages. They were more hunter-gatherers versus like large cities and large civilizations. And that the civilizations would have been too small for the really large battles and all the warfare that's had mm -hmm. in the Book of Mormon, that the Book of Mormon almost needs there to be a very large population. I think he's saying that Mesoamerica would have had the large cities and large civilizations and that there's a lot of warfare happening and that right. the Hopewell civilization wouldn't support one uh, large cities or civilizations and uh, large battles with, you know, thousands or tens right. of thousands. What's your, sure. what's your response to that criticism? Well, first off, there's no, um, other than the Jaredites had their little census at the very beginning, there's no census in the Book of Mormon. So we have no, literally no way of knowing how big their population was. This okay. gets back to the facts, assumptions, inferences thing. So in terms of facts, we have a few discrete facts in terms of how large their armies were, but we have no indication of what area those armies were recruited from or um, if they were all males or what age groups they were, none of that detail to assess what the population is. It's all based on a series of assumptions. That for the 2000 uh, uh, stripling warriors, you're all young men. Yeah, we don't even know how old they were, you know? No, that's <laughs> so, true. I mean, we assume that they were young men, but is that- Maybe, maybe they're all like 16? 50 year olds. <laughs> and like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and Mormon became a general at age 14. So, you know- oh, that's tr that's true. How young could you go? So, you know, it, it's it's just a series of assumptions. And as I recall, when Lehi left Jerusalem, they say, the archaeologists say the population was about 25,000 in Jerusalem, which was the main city that everybody talks about, the great city of Jerusalem, right? So in, the, in America, whether you say American continent or America, the country, but in America, we don't know how, how big these Nephite cities were. We have no indication whatsoever. And so people bring lots of assumptions to it, as I just said. So I, I went through the um, actual thousands enumerated in the text. And the, in fact, I have a list of it here. I just pulled it up because the largest armies ever enumerated in the whole Book of Mormon was 50,000 Lamanites at one point versus 30,000 um, Nephites. That's, that's, quite talk, big, that's quite big. Yeah, it is. 50,000. Yeah. yeah. It's not millions. It's not hundreds of thousands. It's 50,000. Mm -hmm. And this was in, in the wars leading up to Camorra. So this is where all the Lamanites, at least the ones involved, were converging on the Nephites and pushing them out of the land, and they were the Nephites were retreating, right? So the first time Mormon enumerated his armies was in um, verse 9 of chapter 2, in three, roughly 330 AD, and he said we had 42,000 men, and that was after gathering all the people. So they had 42,000 in their army. I don't know if he said men or not. I think he just said our, an army of 42,000. And then it was about uh, 15 years later, his army was down to 30,000. Whereas the, the Lamanites had increased their armies from, let me just to make sure I, everybody's clear on this. First Mormon said he had an army of 42,000, the Lamanites had 40,000. And then 15 years later, he said, I had only 30,000, but the Lamanites now had 50,000. So the Lamanite army had grown, which makes sense because the Nephites were in retreat. They were getting wiped out, decimated. And the Lamanites were continuing to recruit and attack. You know, they, they could see that the Nephites were losing. And so they just pursued them up, in my view, from Ohio up to Western New York. So by the time they got to Camorra, which was even a decade or so after that, they would have had even fewer people, in my view, because they'd gone from 42,000 down to 30,000. How many would be left? And again, we, we talked also, I think, in terms of these aren't specific numbers of people. These are military units. Yes. And I, I did a, an interesting analysis here where the Book of Mormon talks in terms of 2,000, 6,000, and 10,000. So there were 2,000 stripling warriors. I think it said 2,080. And then other times there were 2,000 groups of 2,000, groups of 6,000, and groups of 10,000. Those all look like military units to me. So those are, we could say, round numbers, you know. So I, I've seen various calculations based on different assumptions of if you had an army of 50,000 and you assume that they were all males between the age of 20 and 30, then that means the overall population was this big. 
Or if you had an army of 50,000 and you assume they were all between the age of, say, 14, like Mormon was, and age, say, 50, then the population would be far smaller than that, right? So as you, as you go through the analysis, everybody's analysis is based on assumptions. And I just look at it and say, well, all I know is the army shrunk in size from 42 to 30, and I think 20 by the time they got to Camorra. So that's, that's not a massive population. And the Hopewell civilizations, as, as I showed in these charts, they were extensive. You know, the, one, one expert wrote a book and said there were a million mound sites. I know I've been in the office of the uh, Illinois State Archaeologist, and on his wall, he has a map of Illinois. And it has every archaeological site that they found. And it's all dotted with red dots. But in some places, there's straight lines. And we asked him, were these Indians or Native Americans, were they building things in straight lines? And he goes, no, that's wherever we put a railroad or a highway. That's the right of way. And everywhere we dig, it's full of artifacts and civilizations. So we don't really have any idea how big the population of the Hopewell and Adena was. They've all, even in Illinois, where this guy had all these dots all over the wall, there are lots of empty space out there that they haven't dug. And he says, but everywhere we dig, there's evidence of ancient civilizations here. I, I've talked to a guy who was on a, a highway crew, and he told me that they were doing their preliminary excavation, started digging up all these bones, and they told the foreman, and he says, cover them up and don't tell anybody, otherwise this project will stop and we'll all be out of work, you know? So those kind of things really happen. It's because there's a federal law that protects Native American remains. And anytime you dig something up, it belongs to the federal government in a sense, or the, the tribe that can identify it. So estimates of populations of the Hopewell, as far as I'm aware of, are far uh, fewer than the archeology span would support. Okay, Plus so you have you're, so you're saying that the estimates that people are saying that they're more like hunter-gatherer and they're small, villi small villages and they're not, yeah. it, they wouldn't have the population size to support like armies of tens of thousands fighting in the Book of Mormon. You're saying that the archaeology may not support that, but actually it, they might have been much well, larger civilizations that yeah. could have had these large-scale battles. Right, and well, and, and I should qualify that by saying there's some areas where it was there was very little if anything, rudimentary mounds, like a burial mound for a family, something like that, when they count a million mounds. But others were very extensive. And like the ones that I showed in this book, you know, how many people would it take to build some of these? Mm. And one of them is uh, Fort Hill, I think, is one that's very extensive. And it's you can go to the visitor center there today, which I have visited. And it's, uh, as I recall, about 150 acres. It's all enclosed with these 10-foot tall walls. It's up on a hilltop. It'd be very difficult to build. And when I look at that, I think, well, that had early settlers thought it was a military fort, which I still think it was today. But the ar archaeologists say, well, there's no evidence of warfare. And so we think it was just a ceremonial spot. And it's just strange credulity to believe that. So there's differences of opinions among archaeologists about the dating of these things and about the scope of, of the civilization it would require to build it. But it, you wouldn't be hunter-gatherers and build these sophisticated earthworks that you replicate over vast distances. And then there's a great Hopewell Road in um, Ohio. It was a large, wide road built between, I don't remember, two or 300 miles between some of these sites going right through Illinois. And you can still see part of it today in, in Google and, and archaeo, you know, um, belief maps. And that indicates another extensive civilization. You know, there's a book called 18, no, 1491, I think, by Charles Mann. And he talked about the pre-Columbian North America. Going to him, around 97% of the Native Americans were killed before most Europeans ever got here from smallpox and other things. Mm -hmm. And so the civilizations used to be far more extensive than we would be led to believe today. But even at that, I don't think they had to be that big to be Nephite. Because I'm saying... Uh, Mormon said after they gathered the people together, he had an army of 42,000. So that doesn't tell me. It. And this is a war of extinction. You wouldn't be having only the professional military people. Everybody would be in, involved to defend themselves. Right. So, right. I, you know, if I had to guesstimate, I would say the Nephite civilization is probably between one and 200,000, at least at the time Mormon was enumerating these armies. 
Okay. And again, it gets, okay. gets back to this idea of multiple working hypotheses. And what I've, what I've observed over time, because I've been involved with this for decades as a, since I'm so old, right? <laughs> 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 but when I was a college student and I was reading all this stuff, there was a lot different interpretation of the Book of Mormon than there is now among the Mazo guys. Because the more things they uncover with LIDAR and so on in Guatemala and Southern Mexico, the bigger the Book of Mormon civilization turns out to be. They just they just keep reinterpreting it to match the geography, or the, or the um, anthropology and so on, which is fine. I mean, that's a legitimate approach. You want to update your thinking with latest um, findings, latest right. data. But if when you when your interpretation of the Book of Mormon changes based on what the archaeology is and the size of the civilizations they're discovering down there, I mean, the Book of Mormon civilization must have been massive. You know, an army of 42,000, you must have had 10 of those armies or 20 of them or more, you know, to, to fit that civilization. So, and I admit, I do the same thing. I, I, in, I was reading through the Ohio Archaeological Journal, and they talked about when they were doing an excavation, and they knew that the civilization or the, the settlement had been there, and the archaeology told them that later on, they built a wall around it. And they, they, they thought that didn't make sense, because normally you would build a wall first, and then you'd build your city inside. But in this case, they built the wall after the fact. But that's exactly what Moroni, General Moroni did, right? He went around fortifying the cities. So right. when I read that, yeah. I think, okay, well, that makes sense. There's an actual legitimate non-LDS archaeological site in Ohio that describes exactly what Moroni said. So, and, and I, I, you know, there's, there's an element of time. You, I, you can say I'm an artist. I have a lot of other interests. I do a lot of traveling. I'm not a full-time Book of Mormon archaeology person. <laughs> <laughs> but I have spent time with archaeologists in the Midwest and in Western New York, and I've seen enough to satisfy me that there's far more there if there was funding and interest to do it, that we would be out there excavating and making all kinds of discoveries to corroborate the Book of Mormon. But even what's out there is sufficient. So, so can I ask um, maybe just like one more topic and then maybe sure. just a couple of rapid fire questions? Are you OK for time? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk next about geology, uh, particularly <laughs> when it comes to the destruction in 35. So I did an episode with Jerry Grover, who's a geologist. Right. And right. I I want to first talk about what, um, what do you believe is the geological explanation for what happened in 35? You know, growing up, I would have just thought like, well, it's all supernatural. Uh, something I found <laughs> yeah. interesting about yeah, yeah I, I wouldn't have thought about like there being any geological explanation sure. something that i found very interesting in favor for mesoamerica was when i did the episode with jerry grober he he said right. he looked at john Sorensen's model and it was i believe the san martin volcano he said that there was right. likely an eruption due to the first century uh bc that there was a earthquake and volcanic eruption and that the the hazards and the things that would have followed uh, match and correlate the description in 35 you know things like the yeah, darkness course. storms uh lightning sharp lightnings uh not being able to light a torch you know thick darkness uh coming from the ash um he even talked about like why certain cities sunk and um he used that and to me at the time whenever i looked at it, i was like this seems to support and almost be like another way to test the mesoamerican geography model yeah. um so I want to ask, what is what is your view of what geologically caused it? And then I want to ask a couple of follow-up questions that Jerry sort of raised okay. to me to get your sure. response. Okay, my first reaction to all this is, it's like the snow question. Why are there no volcanoes in the Book of Mormon? Never mentions a volcano. So Can I give a response? Was What's that? Can I give a response? So yeah, my, sure. my, my response to that would be, that the Book of Mormon doesn't have to mention a volcano. They may not even have realized what caused it. So they may have viewed it as supernatural. But Jerry is saying that the best thing that uh, supports this is a volcanic eruption and an earthquake. And that we can we can find one that is in sort of like the right area that sort of yeah. all the characteristics or hazards that <laughs> right. follow. Okay. Yeah, no, I um, understand yeah. that. But I, I'm saying in a thousand years of history in Central America, they never mentioned volcanoes. Every okay. culture that's okay. ever lived down there has, volcanoes are a major problem for them. Mm -hmm. now, I've been down in Guatemala. I've seen that big um, in Antigua where that huge volcano is up there that's erupting all the time. 
there, and there's been lots of cities in the past and, and people, I guess, who have been inundated by the volcanic eruptions down there. And so it's, it's an ever-present danger. And yet it's never even mentioned in the Book of Mormon. Even in Third Nephi, they don't say. To, to say that they wouldn't know what happens when a volcano erupts, to me is, you know, it's, I don't want to say it's preposterous, but it kind of is, you know, because everybody that lives around a volcano knows what a volcano can do. Mm. So, but that, that I, I acknowledge that's kind of a superficial response, but it's equivalent to the snow question. Right, okay. Right. So, but what I would say uh, about North American geography, you know about the New Madrid Fault, I think yes. we might have even yeah. talked about that. And when you go to the museum there in New Madrid and you walk through the exhibits and see the descriptions of the people who survived it, this was in 18, 11 and 12 or 10 and 11, the early 1800s. Their descriptions sound like they just came right out of Third Nephi in terms of the river going backwards, submerging things. They, it was so dark they couldn't see and so on. And so, and, and I think last time I mentioned too that the original capital of Illinois was Kaskaskia which was the largest city at the time. And then the Mississippi River flooded, changed course. The entire town was inundated and wiped away. And now it's just the farming community across the river. And it, there's, a, there's some really interesting uh, geographical reconstructions of the Mississippi River over time based on, uh, you know, they do their soil samples. And they, it looks like a mass of spaghetti just coming down, interweaving. And there's, um, one of the famous examples was a riverboat. Did we talk about the riverboat that sunk? No. We talked about uh, this last time. Okay. <laughs> it's, it might sound irrelevant, but I'll tell you why it's relevant. So yeah, in the, in the yeah. mid-1800s, there was a riverboat that actually had transported some Mormons to Utah. But it was going up the Missouri River, and it sunk with everything aboard. People just jumped off and abandoned all the whiskey and all the silverware, everything that they were transporting. So it sunk to the bottom of the river. And, and there had been treasure hunters looking for it because of all the potential treasure that was in there, all the artifacts. And it wasn't until I think it was around 1990, something like that, that these treasure hunters were, were going up and down the river looking for it with their ground penetrating radar. And some farmer said, what are you looking for? And he said, well, we're looking for the riverboat. And he goes, well, when I bought this farm, the, the old boy told me that the riverboat is underneath my farm about a half a mile from the river. And he showed them where. So they decided to dig it up. They dug down, they dug down, they dug down, I think two or 300 feet before they found this riverboat. And mm. then they excavated the whole thing and it's on display in, in Kansas City, right down. It's quite deep, like two or 300 feet. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it is, and a half a mile away from the river on top of that. And this is only about 125, 130 years after it sunk. That's how much the river can change. So when they um, when they talk in in the Book of Mormon about the uh, the cities being sunken and buried, those are both explained by what happens along that Mississippi River, in particular when there's an earthquake like there was in New Madrid. And so, to me, I know Jerry thinks that well it doesn't explain everything, but I don't I, I can't remember what he says it doesn't explain because I've gone through the text and I've gone through the reports from New Madrid, and they all correspond. The other aspect of that is we don't know for sure how big the previous earthquakes were along the New Madrid Fault, other than that they occurred. And I, I've seen some, I haven't brushed up on it in the last few years, but when I first looked into this, there were times of massive earthquakes in the past, but they can't identify exactly when they were. And even the New Madrid Fault was extensive enough to cause I think the saying is the church bells in Boston to, to ring or something. So they were felt throughout the northern United States, the northwest or the midwestern United States. So to me, that fits. And the land northward is starts right at that uh, conjunction of the rivers there. So it would have included the land northward. Hmm. Um, I don't know. To me, to me, it's a good fit. I, I know Jerry doesn't agree, but that's fine. I what does he know? He's just a geologist that thinks he can translate characters. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. exactly. So I've got, I've got well, a couple of follow-ups because Jerry Jer okay, wanted me to sure. ask these questions. And these yeah, are my questions okay. as well. So one of the things yeah. he said to me is that um, the heartland does not have a good explanation for the mist of darkness for three days, that there's no good 
uh, scientific geological explanation. There's like anecdotal experiences of like smog, but what what's sort of like your your explanation for the three well, days of darkness? People talked about that in the New Madrid. Let me make sure this is about. People talk about that the New Madrid uh, Visitor Center. It was these these massive uh, dust blows. What do they call them? Sand blows that would just fill the air, mm -hmm. and people couldn't see for days. So. I mean, if you've been through a, a, a dust storm, now Jerry would say, well, the dust settles faster than that. But I don't know how long it, it depends on what the topsoil is like and so on. So people talked about not being able to see or light a candle and all the same stuff. Right. The The, the biggest um, criticism or takeaway that Jerry made in our episode was he showed the New Madrid fault line and, you know, for the destruction that happens, you know, in the Book of Mormon, I think he said it'd have to be probably like seven or eight on the Richter scale, like a lot of destruction. And and he talked about the effects of the earthquake wouldn't have been powerful enough to have reached up to like the Great Lakes region and the land northward. And the Book of Mormon talks about the, the most of the destruction, the biggest destruction occurring in the land northward. So basically that the, the earthquake that would have happened at the new Madrid fault line wouldn't have extended up that far north to have caused the major destruction that was sort of like the main thing he said so geologically it wouldn't have reached uh you know nephite lands land well, what's your response remember we remember i said the land northward is a relative term it's not a proper noun uh, so his definition of land northward may be a specific place but it's just relative to wherever the speaker was well, at that time in the Book of Mormon, they would have been in Bountiful from well, writing about in we, Third we, Nephi. This is the kind of question you have to bring up the, the text and go through and parse it out so mm -hmm. you know exactly what everybody's referring to. But in, in general terms, the, the temple in Bountiful, when they arrived there and they, they met the Savior, I think by now most people agree that that took place a year after the destruction, right? Doesn't everybody agree with that? So a year after the destruction, the savior came. I thought it was. I thought it was yeah. like days in the Book of Mormon. No. No. Uh, okay. Well, this well, is. I'm, I'm not an expert. I'm just, yeah. I'm, okay. I'm not. I'm not an expert, but I. I know. I think most people now think it was a year later, oh, or okay. at least eight, seven or eight months later, something like that. Right. And you can tell that from the text. He didn't. There wasn't just all the destruction all of a sudden he appeared. Uh huh. Uh, uh -huh. That, but that's that's another example where we should bring up the scripture and go through it. We don't want to take the time right now, but. There are articles written about all this. Okay. And that's my understanding anyway, is that it was after they had already had several months of reconstruction and doing things, they were assembled at the temple in Bountiful, and that's when the Savior came. So that that's, that's not how the movie know. The Testaments depicted it. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know the funny thing about that movie though? The the director said he he filmed it in the wrong place because he filmed it to look like Maze America and now he's a Heartlander. Oh really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He'll, he'll have to make an, a remake then. Well, okay, he so, wishes he could. <laughs> so um, okay. So so you think land northward isn't necessary? That's uh, subjective where you put it, and you you think yeah. that there could have been an earthquake uh, historically in the past that could have made it. Uh, far northward of the new Madrid fault line that could have had the all the destruction well i think the new madrid okay if, if you were at say the new madrid anything north of that's the land northward mm -hmm. right which would which would encompass the city of zarahemla the whole land of zarahemla really and and anything else northward of that so jerry's saying that well it had to be this high northward to qualify i'm saying didn't have to be any particular place, just northward of the frame of reference. I think um, if I just, let me see, let me just share my screen, if you can see that. So I think yeah. um, he says, so like, this is the new Madrid fault line. So like where it's red, right. that's like extreme shaking. Sure. Uh, and then as you go out, um, it, it becomes like, say, very strong, strong, moderate. And I think the point he was making is that uh your geography model would have been more maybe where it's like yellow maybe a little bit of orange and then green so i, I think the point he made for the destruction for like buildings to collapse and you know the the big destruction that's spoken about in third nephi it would have almost had mm -hmm. to be like where it's red 
in the new manager fault line. And he was sort of making the argument that it wouldn't have, been, wouldn't have extended up to where the heartland geography is. Well, okay. For, in the first place, this was the earthquake of 1811 and 1812, not the one from 34 BC or 34 AD. That's right. Okay. It does say, yeah, so, it says there, 1811, yeah. 1812. So and and we know a lot about that because people are documenting it and feeling it and so on. This one is interesting because it doesn't show. There's a line up there by Boston. I don't know what that means. Oh, the limit of perceived shaking. Okay. So what, what it doesn't show oh, yeah. is up there, yeah. the effect. On, yeah, what it doesn't show is the effect on the rivers. You know, and and like along the Mississippi River, it turned the river up stream in some areas, at least in one area. So it reversed the course of the Mississippi River, it created new uh, rivulets or new uh, courses for it, and had major impact along there. So if the people of Nephi were living anywhere in the land of what I would call the land of Zarahemla, they would have been destroyed by this, for sure, you know. So as far as where, how far north is the land northward, Again, it gets back to just making assumptions. I mean, he's saying that it had to be that, that the earth, the damage had to be all the way north there. And I was just, I just pulled up um, chapter nine to kind of look through it. But it says, let's see. Okay, the great city Zarahemla burned with fire. It wasn't destroyed in uh, by the river. But city Moroni was sunk in the depths of the sea, which again, this is that sea area I was talking about. Great city Moroni ha was covered with earth, didn't say volcanic rock or anything or lava, but it was covered with earth, which happens when you have this upheaval of the sand blows during these earthquakes in the Midwest, which is very deep topsoil. City of Gilgal was sunk, which happens along the rivers. Um, the waters came up over these other cities. Onaha, Mokum, and Jerusalem, that all fits. Uh, other cities were sunk, made hills and valleys in the places thereof. That's exactly what happened during the New Madrid uh, earthquake. Uh, let's see, another one was burned with fire. Okay, there's all kinds of causes for that. And others were burned with fire, okay. None of it says they were burned with lava, of course, but, but fires would start anytime you had a shaking of the earth if people were using candles and there were fires. So that all makes sense in an earthquake. Um, many other destructions. Yeah, I don't see anything in here. I'm trying to see where it says bountiful in here, but I don't see that. Hmm. Maybe it's in a later, it might be in a later chapter. Well, the next, in, in chapter 11, he came to the temple in bountiful. Mm hmm. It never says there was destruction in Bountiful. It says, here's no. what it says. I think Bountiful stays intact. I don't know if it stayed intact, but it wasn't destroyed. Yeah. Like like these other ones. Here it says, and, and this is interesting. It says, this is uh, 35, 11, 1. Now it came to pass, there was a great multitude gathered together, the people of Nephi, round about the temple, which was in the land Bountiful. So we don't know where in the land Bountiful the temple was, but that's where they gathered. They were marveling and wondering one with another and were showing to one another the great marvelous change which had taken place. It doesn't say there was anything about being destroyed, just that there was a change that had taken place. They were conversing about this Jesus Christ, and while they were conversing, he appeared to them, right? So to say that the, all this destruction happened in the city bountiful or even in the land bountiful is not what the scriptures say. I don't, you know, I don't know how to reconcile that. You could certainly infer that it was if you wanted to. You can make an assumption. But the scriptures don't list bountiful. When you first said that, I asked me that question. I thought, I wonder if it does say that destruction happened in bountiful. That's why I pulled did these I, Did I say that? No, no. But Jerry is saying that. I think, no, if I'm remembering, um, I think Jerry said that bountiful wasn't destroyed. And he said that there's geological reasons uh, that support that in John Sorensen's model, but why some other cities? Uh, well, then why why would he say the New Madrid wouldn't reach up to Bountiful if, there, if it wasn't destroyed? I missed the whole point. I guess I thought oh, he no. was saying so. That... He would say that not just like Bountiful, but like all the destruction that took place, basically in your Heartland geography model, 
Oh, uh, okay. That it wouldn't reach up to to cause the massive destruction, even if your land northward isn't like super north, that it the effects wouldn't have reached up to where your geography is. Okay. Okay. If that makes well, sense. okay. If if that's what you're saying, I thought you were saying it had to reach all the way up to Bountiful because Bountiful was destroyed. Oh so, no no no. So there's this list of of cities that we don't know where they were, and they were in the land northward, which is a relative term. So if you look at that map again, you'll see from St. Louis, well, New Madrid is south of St. Louis, but from, from New Madrid north, there is massive destruction all along the river there. Presumably, most of their cities were built along the rivers because that's where people live, naturally. You don't, <laughs> you don't live out in the plains. You always want to be by a river if you're an ancient person. So I don't see any consistency whatsoever. I, I misunderstood. I thought you were saying that Jerry said there had to be destruction in Bountiful. No, and I think he, he said the opposite. Away. Apologies if I okay. misspoke. So um, no, you probably didn't. So Jerry and I agree basically that Bountiful is too far away from New Madrid to be destroyed. Right. So we agree. He he is inferring that these other cities listed were up somewhere in Bountiful, but it doesn't say that in the text. So okay. I infer they were down along the river in the Lanzaria Hamlet. So two different okay. assumptions. That's fine. Why don't we do a few rapid fire questions yeah, sure. uh, to finish okay. off? This has been fun. I've really enjoyed yeah. this and I really appreciate I you responding to, to some of these tough sure. questions. Uh, so um, where, where are we at? Okay, so one criticism people bring up is, and I'm going to have to read this question. Um, it's about artifacts and that there's maybe Heartlanders, and I'm not saying yourself, but some Heartlanders yeah. have maybe uh, promoted artifacts to support the Book of Mormon that have maybe either not been seen as credible by archaeologists or maybe sure. turn out to later be fake or a hoax. Um, right. So this question is, Heartlanders rely on the Michigan relics as proof of their proposal. Uh, so this question, do you, do you believe the Michigan relics to be valid artifacts? What about the New York Decalogue stone? Okay, the, the Michigan tablets to me is still an open question. I know James Talmadge went and investigated it because um, they were sensational at the time. And he found, he got a statement from the granddaughter, I think, of Soper saying that she was there when her grandfather was manufacturing these tablets out in the shed. <laughs> so we know that those guys definitely were manufacturing tablets on, on slate, roofing slate, basically. So that part of it, I totally agree with. I think every Heartlander agrees with the Soper Savage fraudulent artifact element okay the question right. is what were they copying you know did they just invent these out of thin air or were they copying actual ancient artifacts and that's the real question and it's, to date no one has ever gone through all the artifacts that have been that are at the uh, university of michigan to authenticate every one of them being from the 19th century roofing material so that's the first thing Second thing is there's a lot of the mission art artifacts that aren't in the museum in Michigan that are in private collections around the country. And those definitely have never been tested or authenticated one way or the other, as far as I know. And so, I, you know, I was over in Lebanon once and I was with an archaeologist going through some sites. This dude came up and handed us a bunch of coins to see if we wanted to buy them. And the archaeologist looked at him and says, well, I have no idea if they're authentic or not, but they're pretty cool. So I bought a bunch of them. You know, and to this day, I don't know if they're authentic or not, because I've looked them up on the the websites and it looks like they're authentic, but they could e easily stamp. And uh, in modern times, they could stamp metal and make it look like it's authentic by wearing it down and so on. But the point is that they were copied from original ones at the very least. And in my view, to have the Michigan artifacts just appear out of thin air these guys just invented them doesn't make any sense to me i think the most logical explanation for me is that there were at least a handful of authentic ancient michigan tablets that people found and these guys said oh these are cool let's make copies of them and maybe expand on them or something so distinguishing between those two is i don't know how possible that is from a because they're not metal they're all on, engraved on slate or you know, stone. So I guess the answer to it is I wouldn't rely on those. I certainly have never talked about them in my books that I can recall. 
Um, I think it's an intriguing possibility going forward. At one time, the church owned them and still didn't study them all. It was Howard, or, uh, what was his name? Uh, Milton R. Hunter's family, as I recall, had them because they were donated. And then the church gave them back to Michigan um, over the ejection of some of the family members. And I've talked to some of those family members and they wish they still had them. And I think it would be a, a fascinating study to actually go through all the tablets and see if they are all 19th century or some of them are more ancient. Okay. But I don't I don't know any Heartlanders that rely on that for their for the theory. I mean the Heartland concept is that the prophets are right about Kamora. Where do we go from there? Okay. This question I probably should have grouped in when we were talking about civilizations, um, uh -huh. the Adena civilization, but this one says archaeologists and radiometric dating of the Adena sites showed the Adena existed from 500 BC to 100 AD, roughly. Mm -hmm. um, and right. the question is, how can this match the Jaredite chronology from the Book of Mormon, who would have came you know, far earlier than that? Well, I, I don't know. I think that what I've seen in the Dina is far ancient, more ancient than that. So I'd have to see oh. that source. Okay. But as far as overlapping to 100 AD, that's consistent with what we've already talked about. How when was I met up with the people of Zarahemla, there were still Jer Jaredites in the more broad sense just not Jaredites of the ones that Moroni wrote about in the Book of Ether up in, in this okay. North country. Right. Uh, last few yeah, rapid Actually, fire. that 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 dating that they just gave you there, Adina, sounds more like the Hopewell dating. Because it was roughly Yeah, actually, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. No, the question says Adina. Um I think I think they meant Hopewell. Okay, maybe. But not. the Hopewell actually lasted until around four hundred AD and then they their whole civilization kind of crumbled. Right. Which also obviously correlates to the Book of Mormon. So uh okay. Uh let's see. Last few questions. Um, so one criticism of the Heartland geography model is that the main proponents, like you've got, you know, Wayne May, maybe yourself, Rod Nellinger, oh, right. I'm sure there's others, but you're probably the most uh, noticeable ones who are, out, you know, podcasting and, you know, doing right. books and things on it. Um, yeah. People would say that there, you don't have any, and I know this might be like a fallacy, like the appeal to authority, but somebody might say yeah. like, is there any like LDS archaeologists, anthropologists, geologists, who are supporting it and if not is that not a sign that like if experts who are like archaeologists or anthropologists or geologists are leaning more towards mesoamerica is that not like a little bit of a red flag towards like should we be more cautious when it comes to accepting yeah, the evidence yeah. being proposed for a heartland what's your response to that sure well my response is that i i have met with actual non-lds archaeologists and discussed these things and the evidence that they have corresponds or converges on the Book of Mormon, but they're not LDS. They don't, they don't believe the Book of Mormon. And it's a, a same thing that happens in Mesoamerica. Well, yeah, because because Grant and John Sorensen would say they do the same thing with Mesoamerican yeah. scholars and what totally. they're saying about yeah. archaeology and, and the civilization that's right. and they're showing, that's right. look how this converges in some ways with the Book of Mormon. Yeah, that's right. Exact same thing. The difference is that they have their degree. You know, John, I took a class from John Sorensen at BYU, and he has a PhD in, I think it was anthropology or something. Uh, it could have been archaeology, but I don't call that. And I had other archaeology professors down there, Ray Matheny and some others when I was at BYU. But there, I mean, back then, the Heartland was not even a consideration. Right. That, that was not right. even on the radar screen. It only became on the radar screen for me about 10 years ago. And so you, in order to have... LDS students who want to study archaeology and, and geology and, and so forth to focus on the heartland, they would have had to start school right about now, realistically, to even be aware that this was a thing. And so the other thing is on the funding side, if you're a student and you want a scholarship or you want a job afterwards, you have to be a Mazo guy because that's where all the money is in the church right now. Book Mormon Central raises millions of dollars to promote this Mesoamerican stuff. And they have a big staff, and you have to be a Mazo guy to even work there, you know, or to volunteer there to write. That's one of the interview questions. <laughs> well, you do. And so, as a result, it's like um, I, I could think of a million analogies, but that's why you, you failed the interview. All of the money. What's that? I said, I'm just joking. I said, that's why you failed the interview. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, I feel like um, 
there's there's an enormous amount of archaeological material available. Anybody who wants to look at it. And the other complication is Indiana, Ohio, Illinois, they don't work together on their art sites. They're all kind of independent. And, and the archaeologists, state archaeologists in those places have different ideas and, and different theories. Brad Lepper is the state archaeologist in Ohio. And he's, I wouldn't say he's anti-Mormon, but he's familiar with the Book of Mormon and distances himself from it as much as he can, just like the, the, the legitimate Mesoamerican um, archaeologist in Central America. You know, that there's been plenty of criticism of LDS theories about Mesoamerica by actual LDS or non-LDS archaeologists. I, yeah. I, I it was probably, some time probably being Michael Coe. Uh, Michael Coe, was public. many others too. Michael Coe is just the one that's outspoken about it. Right. But I, I met with a well-known general authority whose brother is a Mesoamerican archaeologist who's written textbooks on it. He showed me this guy's three or four books and he left the church over this because he said as long as they're the, the church, he felt like the church was saying took place in Mesoamerica. He says, there's nothing down here that makes any connection to the Book of Mormon. If that's where they're teaching, it can't be true. And so, and and I think more and more people are starting to feel that way because we read through, I mean, Brant's awesome. He's a good author. He, he makes all these convergences that kind of, if, if you suspend your disbelief, you can kind of go along with it. But the reality is, it's, it's, um, confirmation bias through and through that's all it is and that's why non-lds archaeologists think they're nuts and you know I, I the state archaeologist in new york was telling me he gets letters from mormons from time to time asking him if there's any evidence of the book of mormon in western new york you know and he says i don't know how to respond because i don't even know what the book of mormon talks about but the reality is that there are it, there is archaeological evidence of the Hopo from Ohio coming up around 400 AD, building rudimentary fortifications on the hilltops. And there's still sites there that people can go and look at that I've been to. And so to me, that's a pretty strong convergence on the Book of Mormon. It's not proof because nothing says made in Zarahemla, you know. It's the, the but, difficult thing because like people who as far as more of the Mesoamerican geography model, they feel like, okay, we've got like, uh, you know, scholars, archaeologists, anthropologists yeah, who are seeing the convergences. And I yeah, know. no non-LDS archaeologists see it, but that's because they don't believe in the Book of Mormon. Yeah. But then they think the Heartlanders are ridiculous and absurd and crazy and they don't have real yeah. science archaeology supporting them. Yeah. Heartland think the same about Mesoamerica and the people who don't believe in the Book of Mormon uh, think that about all of it. <laughs> that well, and this is no why this is why it comes back to Komora, because in my view, if you could, I, I actually did a blog article where I said anybody who can't locate the Book of Mormon anywhere in the world is just not imaginative enough. You could locate it in Pakistan, you could in Angola, anywhere in the world, if Ireland. you interpret it, massage it, <laughs> or Mesoamerica. But I mean, it's seriously, it's it's a. Uh, it just takes a little imagination to locate it anywhere. It could be in England. You know, I, I bet I can make a strong argument Book of Mormon took place in England <laughs> based on the text. Because if it's not in Mora, that means the prophets were wrong and we're all kidding ourselves all along to begin with. Okay. So, so I, want, I want to ask the next question on that. So this is sort of a question that I've sort of rephrased. So some people would say that the proponents of the heartland model that they are fundamentalists i'm doing a bit of stereotyping yeah. here they're you know, right. typically young earth creationists who believe in like yeah. pseudoscience and right. they would just claim that some of the early prophets or church leaders believe it was north america uh therefore that's where it happened and you have tradition and maybe statements from leaders supporting it but then you ignore all of all other evidence right. going against yeah. what, what's your yeah, response do you feel like that's maybe a <laughs> a stereotype because that's the stereotype i hear like whenever i oh, talk to it's, people people it's are very not even dismissive. a stereotype it's about, a caricature i yeah. would i would call it not even a stereotype because and i've, I've talked about this before but there's international heartlanders couldn't care less about america as a promised land or any of that stuff and th but as i've mentioned i've when i got into this i'm, I'm a trust but verified type of guy and that's why I've talked with archaeologists and read the journals of the Ohio Archaeological Society. And I visited the sites because I wanted to know for myself. I was going to rely on someone saying the Michigan artifacts or the Decalogue stone or that kind of thing. I wanted to go to, to the actual sites and see for myself. 
And I'm completely satisfied that it corroborates the Book of Mormon. Now, that's not to say there aren't heartlanders who are, um, say, young earth creationists or um, what Brandt calls them, um, kind of right-wing nationalists or something. He did an interview about that. So there are people that have those beliefs that are also heartlanders, but it's not because they're heartlanders that they have those beliefs. But there's also scientists who are heartlanders. There's physicists, there's doctors, lawyers. I mean, there's a wide range of people who are heartlanders just based on looking at the evidence. And I think it's important that to realize that most members of the church are oblivious to the heartland stuff. At most, they've read about it from the guys at Book Mormon Central or the interpreter, which is very pejorative, negative, anti-science caricature of what the heartland really is. And yeah, I've, I've had it's that. just very easily dismissed. You're shown yeah, like totally. showing the problems with it, and you're just like, okay, this sounds absurd. Yeah. And it wasn't until I saw listening to the interviews with the Stick of Joseph, where I sort yeah. of realized that you know what, because. I have the personality of, and we all have this, where like when we hear someone who has a different view, you immediately want to mm -hmm. like dismiss it. You know, like with this, yeah. this new movement about like Joseph didn't practice polygamy. Yeah, and like straight right. away your reaction is like, that's absurd. Like this is ridiculous. <laughs> but then right. it's like, uh, I actually had a conversation with Mich Michelle Stone for two hours and she didn't convince me, but I was like, yeah. okay, this is kind of like interesting. She She's done way more yeah. research than me. So mm -hmm. maybe a conversation or a debate is to be had. And I think yeah. it's it's, something it's it's tough because like if somebody were to say that you know the book of mormon took place in you know antarctica i i, I don't think i'd really want to listen <laughs> but in general i think we should try to be relatively yeah, sure. open-minded um yeah. if that makes sense you, you know obviously i i 100 percent agree and and that's why i keep coming back to this for me it's really the issue of Cumorah or bust mm -hmm. because if the prophets were wrong about the hill Cumorah and oliver cowdy didn't really go in the repository and Moroni didn't really talk to Joseph Smith about Camorra, and the messenger didn't really take the plates, the bridge plates to Camorra. And all these narratives that we have fully documented were all false. Then where does that leave us with the rest of the narrative? You know, it's, it's, it seems to me that I understand the argument that, that, that Brandt and others make that, well, they just assumed it was the Hill Camorra. But then you have to reject what everybody said. It's like, well, I think I, uh, guess what? I have a, I have a whiteboard for this. <laughs> oh, okay, go ahead. I, I'm going to ask a question, but I'll let you. This, a a summary whiteboard, okay? So for Kamora, the heartland says everybody was correct and Mesoamerica <laughs> says everybody was wrong, right? That's the bottom line. Okay, They're, well, I have a question and it's a little bit of a pushback. Um, yeah, I sure. Think that's, quite, that's quite funny. That didn't make me laugh. Okay, um, <laughs> so the question is, so you're talking about like, if we don't believe the Book of Mormon took place in, um, you know, Heartland of America, the Hilkmore being in New York, that we're right. rejecting the prophets. Um, certainly, I think that's what many have said. But then what if somebody were to say that, well, how do you deal with other prophets who maybe view, viewed it more as like hemispheric? I'm referred to like the Leonites but, but being all those like, in that's... North Central yeah. South America. And then um, someone might even say that like, are you making an appeal to like prophetic infallibility? Because like, for example, I don't know what your view is on the priesthood ban, but the the church yeah. sort of disavows the past right. racial teaching about, yeah. you know, black skin being a curse or, sure. yeah. and so somebody could bring up the argument that like, um, you know, prophets can be mistaken. They they yeah. can be totally. wrong. And when it comes to the Hilk more, what if, uh, and again, I don't want to come too much in the last episode, but what, what if somebody were to yeah. say that, Maybe this is them later attributing it back to, right. um, you know, early in the 1820s when Joseph was going to the hill, yeah. but that's not how it was referred to, uh, you know, contemporaneously. But that prophets can be mistaken and can have their own sure. assumptions as well. W what's that's your right. response to that? Because sometimes I feel like when people say, well, you're saying the prophets are wrong, it can always seem like like you're claiming then are the yeah, prophets are the infallible. Prophets. And we know yeah. our history. Okay. That, that, that's a fair be. point. That, that's a legitimate point. And yeah. I understand that argument. What I would say is different about this is you have people talking about actually one of the three Nephites taking the abridged place to Camorra. You have um, Oliver Cowdery who claimed he went into the repository full of records and said it was a fact that this was a hill Camorra. That's, that's not you know a revelation 
or it's not a hypothetical, it's experience. And what other experiences did he have that he told us about? He had John the Baptist came. That was not a revelation. It was a physical experience. Same with the restoration of the priesthood keys in the Kirtland Temple. Those were reported as actual experiences, not just revelations they could be wrong about. And that's how I see Kimura is, is aligned with those. Now, they, people will say, well, Lucy Mack Smith but tainted her memory by this false narrative that arose later, right? When she said Moroni identified the hill as Kimura the very first night. But she didn't say anything about the first vision. If she was going to taint her memory, she would have talked about the first vision. But Joseph never told anybody about the first vision. So she omitted that from her narrative. William Smith did the same thing. When William Smith re related his memory of the early days, he never said anything about a first vision. He said Joseph prayed right. and no right. one's church is true and Moroni came. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what they all experienced. So I don't see her as revising her memory to fit a subsequent narrative. If anything, she did the opposite, you know, when she didn't include the, the first vision. And so for me, Lucy has credibility, but it's corroborated by what Joseph Smith himself said in that letter when he said, glad tidings, you know, book to be revealed. So he knew Kimura was there before he ever got the plates. And that's in our scriptures, you know. So and I, I know there's ways to weasel out of that, but really the words are there and, and everybody can read it. And they only make sense in the context of Moroni having done what Lucy said he did. And so I, I, I get your point about infallibility. I'm not going to say the whole church falls apart if, we, if the, you know, the Camorra expedition in Mexico finds a record, the repository of records. Okay. That's a hypothetical question. I didn't even think about that. Well, how would you react if that were the case? <laughs> I'd say, okay, I was wrong. That's <laughs> what I would say. And I'd be fine with that because that's additional information. Right. And I, I changed my mind immediately when I confront better arguments or better information. Right. I'm totally fluid on that. And that's why I became I, I, I hope I'm the same you know? way as well. I, I hope I'm I hope, the same I way. I hope everybody is. Yeah. But the, the problem is, and, and you were, you asked a little bit about Book of Mormon Central, they're not interested in giving people all the information and informing well, people. Well, that's my next question. They're, What's your beef with uh with scripture but, central? Because some of them are my yeah. friend. Well, not like clues, but I've interviewed some of those people and I like all of them. I you know, Kirk Magleby is one of my favorite people in the world. He's just a really nice guy, he's really sincere. They're all devout Latter-day Saints. I love everything about them. Why are you hitting on them? For... What's your beef with them? No, just kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> so what sort of, like, I don't have it. You've been a bit critical, shall we say, towards Scripture Central. What's, yeah, um... I still am. Yeah. And it's all because they don't want people to make informed decisions. They want people to accept what they say. Mm -hmm. They cite their credentials, which in my view are completely irrelevant. They cite their their. Uh, academic journals, which is basically what I used to call the citation cartel, because they just cite each other all the time. It's a big loop that they're in. They have a, a very deep group think, and they just will not. It, for example, in the past, I don't know if you knew, we took a tour with them of Ohio and all this. To, yes. We were going to go yeah. to Central. Yeah. Okay. So at the conclusion of that, we said, well, why don't we just do a side by side comparison with all the evidence and all our interpretations? Yeah, that would be brilliant. First, I know it would be. I've done it myself, you know, without their input. I just use their material and they, they resist that. So their answer was, well, we don't have the budget for it. So we said, well, how much do you need? <laughs> I'd write them a check if it was, you know, some amount that they needed and they wouldn't give us an answer. They just refused to do it. And I was actually in a meeting. I won't say who said it, but they said, well, if we did that, everybody would be heartlanders. And, and it's pretty obvious why, because... What they don't want people to, to realize is that they are directly contradicting what the prophet said. And I know we talked about prophetic infallibility, but it's not just a one-off thing that Brigham Young may have said somewhere. This has been a consistent teaching. In fact, you know, when, when Orson Pratt, I have one of the old Book of Mormons here where he've had his footnotes in here. When he talked about the hemispheric stuff, he said it is believed that or it is thought that, you know, the Highlander in uh, Chile. So he recognized the hypothetical nature of his hemispheric theory, but he said the Hill Cumorah is in New York. And he said the mounds were from the Nephites. So, and that was what Joseph Smith taught. So I think it's um, it's important to make the distinction between what we do know, which is Cumorah's in New York, and what we don't know, which is where the rest of the events took place. That's how I'd summarize the whole thing. Well, I think and that I, the Heartlanders... Well, let me, let me say one more thing about 
Book of Mormon Central as long as yes, or Scripture Central. I've I've met with them. I've proposed that they have a section for Heartlanders on on Scripture Central, and nobody else has to look at it. Just Heartlanders, <laughs> so <laughs> if they're afraid of other people looking at it. And I said, right now, Scripture Central is not central. It excludes thousands, tens of thousands of Latter Day Saints, faithful Latter Day Saints just because they have a different interpretation. And to me, that's the antithesis of academia. It's the antithesis of what any scripture central should be. It should encompass all faithful narratives, and they just refuse to do it. The other thing I asked for was editorial input on, on their material, because they don't realize, they're in this little Mesoamerican bubble, they don't realize how offensive some of their stuff is to those of us who don't believe what they're saying. And they, they just have no concept, I think, of peer review. It's just peer approval. They only have people that already agree with them review their material. And that's that's what leads. That's why, you know, I started, <laughs> as you may have seen on my blogs, if people have pointed it out, I used to be critical of their no-wise because they were, to me, they were it graded on me that they could actually say some of the things they say. And I'm just going to show. I, I even have a blog called The Interpreter Peer Reviewed, where I would review interpreter articles. <laughs> and I was doing the peer review that they wouldn't do, you know. And I, I, I don't have time to well, keep well, doing that. Well, I think that, peer but... review, it's good, right? Because um, it's good to have your ideas and your arguments challenged. I think that's, yeah, for sure. that's a good thing. Like, Because I, yeah, I feel like I totally. get that as a YouTuber. <laughs> You know, yeah. the, the people yeah. that agree more with you will be like, hey, great video, Mark. Loved it. Yeah. But that's why it can be good to have like different, either people who are more nuanced, those who are ex members, yeah. those who are critics, who yeah. can kind of challenge you a bit. And then you're like, okay, I have to really sure. refine my position. Yeah. So I think that's, that's, right. that's it is I, a good I thing. I think that's healthy and important. Yeah. I, I think um, I can understand coming from Scripture Central's perspective. I, I do agree with you. I feel like we should be transparent and look at yeah. the emphasis on both sides i think the downside is say if you're trying to promote how like the book of mormon corresponds really well with mesoamerica look at these convergences yeah. but then if you were yeah. to also show but look at heartland over here it, yeah. you can't really have both if that makes sense I know. so i feel I like know. there almost needs to be like a, a a channel that does like something like equivalent to what scripture central are doing but with heartland doing like yeah. like videos about like evidence like like, I would love to see, and this is going to be a question I'm going to ask, like, where should people go to find, like, evidence, archaeological evidence, things which converge with Heartland? Because I personally have not found it, like, as accessible as what Scripture Central are making. And yeah, although, you know, yeah. they're a very big organization, I feel like something equivalent needs to be done to make it more accessible. Well, have I told you? Let me share a screen here. I, I don't know if I've told you about this. No, this is ahead. the, um, uh, let's see, here it is. This is the Museum of the Book of Mormon, and it's um, a nonprofit. And originally, we were going to actually build a museum, and it oh. was going to be in Palmyra. I had the space. I had the artifacts. The University of Buffalo was going to loan me their artifacts, and I had all the funding, everything ready to go, and then COVID hit, so I couldn't do it. I couldn't open it. And it was oh. it closed it for like a year and a half. And in the meantime, I moved out here to Oregon, sold our house in Palmyra. So we, we, it just kind of closed that chapter. So I put it online instead. And the idea of this is just called mobom.org, Museum of the Book of Mormon.org. And we have a lot of material on here. But one of the things that it, it's organized, you can see it's, it's also not intended only for LDS. It's intended for everybody. And so I point out here, people of all faiths can find inspiration and spiritual truth in the Book of Mormon. I have a section in here for Christians, Muslims, Hindus, everything. But so I have origins, teachings, and evidences. And you can click on any of these and go through. I won't take the time to do it now. So this is your website? It. Yeah, yeah. I'll this put this website. in the description. I want to okay. check this out as well. One, one thing I'll show you here under church history issues uh -huh. If you click on that, I have a list of all these issues that we've been discussing about and more on the origin and setting of the Book of Mormon. And every one of these links goes to an article about that topic with links to the Joseph Smith papers or whatever the resource is. So my, uh, on the evidences here, let me point to that too. I think I have scientific evidences. I click on that, geography, geology, archaeology, and so on. So I do have some. Now, obviously, I'm not spending millions of dollars on this. Yeah. I haven't yeah. really looked at this in the last couple of years, actually. I update it every so often. 
but um, it's my idea was to have a museum of the Book of Mormon that includes all the evidence. I have links to Scripture Central in here because I think people should know what they say. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I, I even, I think I even have a link in here to um, Dan Vogel or something because if it's a museum, it should represent everybody's point of view. And I'm totally like fine that. with people like considering all that. So my here's my dilemma from a practical standpoint. Yeah, I could fund it myself, but in order to do it right, I'd have to spend a lot of time on it, not just money. Right. And right. you know, I, how much more time can I spend? I've already written all these books, <laughs> and I have my art to do. I have the travel, and I have lots of other interests besides this. Other things you need a I team write, to so help you because it'd be too much for one person to do. Yeah. Uh, oh, it is. It is. And and there's um. You know, Rod and, and Wayne are both awesome in what they're doing, but that's for them, it's kind of a livelihood thing where they're going around doing seminars and selling things. And, and that's all legit, perfectly. I have no problem with it. But they don't have the the time or the interest, I guess, of doing a nonprofit like this, where nobody makes any money it's, and nobody sells anything. It's just information. Right. So I've actually proposed to Book of Mormon Central to adopt this. And so far, they've declined. <laughs> what can I say? They are not even interested in an affiliate that shows all the evidence. Yeah. That's just so, because uh, I'm definitely, I lean more with like, I want to I want to see all the different yeah, perspectives, all too. the theories, all me the too. evidence. I think Stick of Joseph yep. are more like that. Because yeah, yeah, like I agree they with are. you. That's, that's about making informed decisions. That's where we would agree with John yeah. Belinda about yeah. informed consent yeah. being important. Yeah, totally. We, we might feel that maybe yeah. his podcast is more emphasizing the, the critical narrative for the most part. Well, he's 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 into confirmation bias as much as everybody else. In a way, he's worse even, but that's another topic we'd <laughs> love to go through someday. But, uh, and something but yeah, I hate as well I like is um, yeah. um, some people can, I hear when people use the argument, you know, like how you said that like Rod Meldrum is, is making a living off, you know, the Heartland mm -hmm. model, that people yeah. will say like, well, these Heartlanders are just doing it because they're making money from it yeah. then you can make the same argument towards those people who work for scripture central Absolutely. that they're earning totally. a living promoting uh mesoamerica Absolutely. and then you get the yeah. critics saying look at these apologists they're earning money but then you could say <laughs> well the <laughs> critics are making money with our podcast yeah. the that's right. a quarter of a million yeah, and then people right. like murph you're making money from this i'm like if i am i'm stupid because <laughs> i don't earn much from it <laughs> so i feel like i hate it when people use that argument that they're just doing it for fame yeah. or for money because yeah. you can make that argument by like anyone so i feel like that's just uh yeah it's an irrelevance i think it's just ad hominem because you can make that yeah. argument towards anyone who's That's put right. a book or made a video on it yeah. but yeah we should look at all the arguments all the evidence and yeah i put the invite out there i i think you're a fascinating person i really yeah. enjoy our discussions i i really like you as a person you you challenge my positions which is frustrating but mm -hmm. also so intriguing <laughs> okay. when you feel like you figured yeah. out book of mormon translation or book of mormon geography um, yeah. But I, I put the invite out there for any Mesoamerican expert who would like mm -hmm. to have a dialogue discussion or more of sure. a debate, challenge Jonathan Neville. Jonathan's willing. I'm more than willing to have you. I think yeah. you could have a very enlightening and civil discussion. I hope mm -hmm. this has been good. I feel like I've wanted to ask challenging questions and just yeah. get your responses. Um, sure. Do you have any any final words you want to give? I, I think you've been a great host on this because you have asked good questions. They're all questions I've already worked through on my own to get to this point. But I, I would, you know, part of the thing is since I'm retired and I, I don't need money, so I, I have the liberty of doing this kind of thing and doing a website and so on and being objective about it and fair to everybody. The, but with Book of Mormon Central or Scripture Central, they have millions of dollars and they still tell me they don't have the budget to do this. Mm. And I can do it on my own. So to me, that's that's not an honest response to say they don't have. Well, you can see with their latest videos on like uh, the greatness of the evidences series. There is a lot of money yeah. put into put into that. There is, there is, and that's one that I would have loved to have had editorial input on, because the critics are already jumping all over those, and I can see why. I mean, for example, I don't know if you want to get into it, but I let's not get into the problems of those videos. But it's just <laughs> an example of where if they had had a little peer review. They could have avoided some major errors they made in those videos that the critics are jumping all over now, you know, and and I think it's 
really unfortunate that they are so insular in, in their little Mesoamerican bubble and their little stone in the hat translation bubble that they they just won't accept any outside input. And I'm not talking about asking John Dillon to peer review it. I'll peer review it. I've, I've had mm -hmm. that offer to the interpreter for years also. Just let me do a peer review. You don't have to accept my suggestions, but at least I can give you a different perspective on this stuff. And they just refuse. Mm -hmm. They think I'm an apostate. They think I should be out of, you know, all this kind of stuff. And I just and think that's crazy. Me. Like, because we're, it is. Like, we're on the same team. Like, you, you're <laughs> a believer know. in the Book of Mormon. You remember the church. You believe the Book of Mormon's yeah. divine and historical. I think we have to put things in perspective. Like, yeah. I like know. even if you feel very strongly about a certain geographical model or theory yeah. of translation, I think like we're on the same team. We should we should dialogue. We well, should discuss these things yeah. together. We should collaborate um, and, and not see and each other as enemies. I, I think they they're projecting on me actually because I don't feel that strongly about Heartland. It's just the most logical conclusion I've reached. Mm -hmm. And like you said, if they discovered Camorra in Mexico, I'd be fine with that. Yeah, I, I'm not wedded to it. It's not part of my income. It's not part of my reputation. It's not part of my identity. It's none of that. I'm just looking at this like a lawyer, basically saying, OK, what's the case? Here's the strongest evidence. So that's what I go with. And and that's why I, I don't take any of this personally. You know, but those some of those guys get really offended if I criticize them. And I don't mean to cause offense, but their arguments are poor and their evidence is bad. So I just point that out. And I think something yeah, I've noticed yeah. as well is that, like, I believe that you are intellectually honest. And I think people yeah. who can be, they can be intellectually honest, but come mm -hmm. to maybe different interpretations Absolutely. or conclusions. Sure. And I think yeah. sometimes I've noticed, not just between Heartlanders and Mesoamerican people, but just like the online discourse, like I hate the online <laughs> discourse yeah, so sure. much. Because I feel like yeah. if people come to a different conclusion, then it's like they're obviously liars with who have yeah, an agenda right. like if you don't if you don't side with me then right. you're obviously dishonest or deceptive and i i just kind of hit that rhetoric like i feel like well let's go back at the very beginning remember i said clarity charity and understanding yeah the clarity part is let's get to the facts and separate the facts from our assumptions charity is assuming everybody acts in good faith yeah and that's sorely lacking in a lot of them. And the third one is understanding because we're not trying to convince anybody. We're just trying to understand what other people think. If we yes. could just stick with those three things, we'd have no more contention. That's why I have the no more contention website. I think we've talked about that. I, yeah, no, I, I love yeah. that. And and if those three principles, if, if Scripture Central would stick with those three principles, we'd all be happy. Everybody in the church would be thrilled with those three principles, but they won't do it. They won't even start with clarity, you know. So an invite and, to Scripture Central in their next, uh, the greatness of the evidence is <laughs> yes. sit down with Jonathan Neville That's and he right. will tear apart Mesoamerica and be like, right. No, I will tear apart. In New York, here's why. I'm not going to tear apart Mesoamerica because I don't want to <laughs> do that. I just want to have clarity. That's all I'm asking for is clarity. What are your assumptions and what are the facts? And if we if we could just reach clarity, we I think charity and understanding would follow that. But if we could just reach clarity, and we can't reach clarity with them. Yeah, and I, I, just do I feel like that's what I want: clarity, understanding. Yeah. And usually, when you have more understanding, yeah. at least I find like as I've dived deeper into things, you're kind of like, okay, I can sort of understand that perspective, and I can understand yeah. that perspective. That yeah. There's facts, and then there's right. you know inferences, different interpretations. Mm -hmm. Um, so I I've actually find like diving in deeper, I'm like I can actually see different people's point of view. Yeah. Totally. Which is so it's of, like studying different religions. I can understand why a, a Muslim believes what he believes. And I think it's interesting. I love, you know, I spent some time with a Coptic Christian in Lebanon learning about his deal. And I thought that was real interesting. I didn't, had no compulsion to convert him. I just want to understand what he was doing and why. Yeah. And I feel like that with the Mesa guys. I'm interested in what Brent does. I've read his books. I think it's an interesting perspective. Yeah, me too. I just think he's on the, he, his initial assumptions are fallacious in my view, but that's fine. You know, we can disagree. There's certainly no animosity. And I just beg them, like you're doing, to let people compare the different perspectives and the different facts. Well, it shouldn't yeah. be different facts. We should all have the same facts. But the different assumptions and inferences. Yeah, that's why I'd, uh, I'd love a Mesoamerican expert who knows mm -hmm. a lot more. Like, I, I don't have enough knowledge to really flush yeah. these things out and debate with you. But I've wanted to ask sure. uh, the questions that I've thought of or people have proposed but i'd love to, mm -hmm. to have a very in-depth discussion and just be able yeah. to see all the arguments the strengths and weaknesses whether or not yeah. it's my channel or stick of joseph 
um it, it would just be really clarifying for people yeah. i don't see why not like if transparency i don't either we're on about and if if the heartland model is super ridiculous then why not come on yeah. and just easily debunk it you know that's it exactly yeah but i think it's because it gets back to the Kimura issue and that's what they don't want to face mm. that's the bottom line that's why they hate it when i use the m2c acronym because they don't they don't want to emphasize that there's two Kimuras. And I said, well, that's if you have a better acronym, I'll use that. But I don't want to write out Mesoamerican to Comoros theory every time, you know. So I just do. I had someone promote, <laughs> tell me I should call it M2CNN, you know, because Heartlanders generally tend to be conservative, so they think CNN is a bunch of lies. Oh yeah. So I should just call it M2CNN. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually made a logo of that as a joke one time. But no, I I think they're all great people. I really like them on a personal level. They're good scholars, but I think they, they have just, um, they're, they're so su su subjective, no, not subjective, they subjected themselves to this confirmation bias and they can't see past it. They literally can't see past it. They don't even realize they're in a bubble. And when I talk to them- Because the church has no official position on geography, I think people should yeah. be open and willing to look at Absolutely. both geography models, compare Absolutely. evidence, arguments, strengths and weaknesses, the critiques of yeah. one, geography, the critiques yeah. of the other, then people can pick the one that they side with the That's most, right? right? I yeah. think we, we, we would all agree there. Well, and you made a good point about how if we have multiple theories floating around, the critics will say, well, that means it's fiction because you guys have no idea where it took place, right? Yeah. But I think that's why I think it's important to have the facts and it spell out our different assumptions. And if you do that, then the critics can say, well, okay, you have different assumptions. That's at least your conclusion. That makes sense. Doesn't mean more the clarity. Is fiction. Yeah. Right. So oh. anyway, I appreciate your efforts to yeah. move, push people in this direction. Yeah, I've, I've enjoyed works. this. I appreciate you coming on and, uh, you know, facing yeah, sure. tough questions. And again, invitations out there if anyone wants to do uh, discussion or dialogue with Jonathan. I've yeah. really enjoyed this time with you yeah, doing this too. interview. I've loved it. I'll put links in where people can go check out your books and your website okay. as well. What was it called? Mobom.org. M-O-B-O-M.org. I'll send you the link so you have it. Awesome. Uh, and people okay. watching, if you've enjoyed this, uh, please comment underneath your thoughts, uh, questions, like this video, share it as well, and subscribe to help grow the channel. And if you want to donate as well, any donations are appreciated. Uh, helps me just keep going with the work I'm doing. I'll see you next time on Mormonism with the Murph. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, everyone, for watching this episode. If you've enjoyed it, please give it a like, share it with others who might benefit, and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future content. You can also listen to these episodes on podcast form on Anchor or Spotify, and you can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Check out my website, for more content, personal blog, and more. And if you care to donate to support me, you can buy my PayPal or Patreon or through the website. And you can also give donations via YouTube through Super Chats. Thanks for watching Mormonism with the Murph. Take care. Bye-bye.